welcome to the Envisioning the Future of Theater for Young Audiences convening. Yay! <laughs> Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you to our hosts at Young Arts for having us in this incredible building where we're surrounded by art all day as we're talking about art for the next generation. Um, I'm just going to do a brief welcome, and then we have a couple other folks doing some welcomes, uh, some of our partners here, and then we're going to jump right in and do a really exciting day of talk about the future of theater for young audiences. So one of my mantras in approaching my work at the National Endowment for the Arts comes from a poem by Mary Oliver, Instructions for Living, and it's pay attention, be astonished, tell about it. In my paying attention to the work happening around the country uh, with theater and musical theater, the work of theater for young audiences consistently has come to the fore. You are inspiring and empowering our next generation of theater artists, audiences, and citizens. And so I find it my duty to take my astonishment and indeed tell about it. The surprise I repeatedly encounter when talking about the excellence of TYA, the field with colleagues both in the theater field and in the funding community, is a continual reminder of why it's so important for us at the National Endowment for the Arts to do what we can through hosting convenings such as the one today to lift up this very important field. Um, before we dive into the great work of today, I want to single out a couple of leaders in the field who are instrumental in making this program happen. Um, there's a full list of our incredible steering committee who first started this planning process. They're all on your program. But today, I just want to focus our attention on two of those individuals. One is Jonathan Schmidt Chapman the head of uh, Theater for Young Audiences USA. His fearless leadership has been incredibly inspiring to me and a reminder, of, again, continually of why this work is so important. And it's been thrilling to have such a great partner in making this convening happen. Uh, and the second is, and we can say this as sort of a swan song farewell to the amazing Michael Bobbitt. Thank you so much. <laughs> When we first, be, the, these conversations first began with Michael and I, Michael presented with his group, Seed Venture Theater, at the National Council on the Arts, I think it was two years ago. And out of that frank conversation going up, I, you know, with me saying, I really want to do something in this field, I don't know how or what we can do. Uh, and that sprung to him making these introductions to Jonathan, to the other leaders on the steering committee in the field about a year ago. And from that came this. So thank you so much, Michael, for your leadership. We're gonna miss you in the TYA field but we wish you well in everything amazing you're gonna do. And I know you're gonna keep lifting up all of us together, so thank you, Michael. Um, so with that, I will, I'm, uh, before we go on to the rest of our introductions, I will just leave you with, again, Mary Oliver's instructions for living and participating in a convening, which is my addendum to it. Pay attention, be astonished, tell about it. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Susan Zeter from the Children's Theater Foundation of America. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. My pleasure. First of all, CTFA, Children's Theater Foundation of America, is thrilled to be a co-sponsor of this event. And I think it is an important event, and perhaps it's a historic event, because we bring together at this convening the component parts of both the present and the future of theater for young audiences in this field. It is the perfect kind of petri dish to provide those elements that change artistic growth, change, artistic innovation in a field that is often underestimated, understated, underfunded, and misunderstood. And I believe that this is the perfect place where the alchemy of now can become a flashpoint for the future. Now some of you may or may not know about what CTFA does. We were founded in 1958 by the then leaders of the field. They were publishers, they were educators, they were administrators. A group kind of like this in many ways. Um, we, at that point, there was virtually no funding available on a regular and a consistent basis for serious theater artists who are doing TYA work. I believe that CTFA, and I could be wrong about this, so those of you guys who are funders, and you know, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe we are still the only major foundation that exclusively and uh, uh, only funds professional theater artists engaged in TYA work. And so if I'm wrong, that's possible. Now we're a tiny foundation, we're small. We have a volunteer board of artists, educators, all practicing artists in the field within that. 
And we have a number of grant programs that provide small grants for innovation and for experimentation, and then larger grants for uh, programs that are coming to their com uh, completion within that. We also bestow awards, and we are increasingly involved now in this kind of creative partnership, which is where we can partner with an organization like TYA USA, like the NEA, et cetera, and provide just a bit of funding that will help uh, uh, with way exponentially larger uh, uh, audiences, et cetera. Now, to that end, CTFA has embarked on an aggressive program of advocacy and activism. And we are focusing our grant programs, our awards, and our partnership work on funding projects that creatively uh, uh, work to deal with dismantling structural and organizational racism. Now, we're doing this not because it's politically correct and not because it's the flavor of the month, but we're doing this because we know at CTFA that funding social change and the arts are inextricably bound up together, and where this starts is with kids, and where this starts is with young audiences. The young people who are flocking to performances in theaters and com community centers all over this country are probably the most racially, economically diverse, age and gender fluid audience you're ever gonna find. They are here, they are with us now. And so I really, really ask you, in order to serve them effectively with live performance, we must speak to their experience and we must be willing to inter interrogate our own assumptions as artists, and as educators, about power, about privilege, and about, uh, uh, we must pursue artistic excellence in all as aspects. If we're gonna serve this audience, we have to speak with them, not our truth, but we have to listen to their truth. Now it's really easy, I think, in an or and I know a lot of you have been here all week, it's, it's really easy to feel that TYA is somehow marginalized. We can't, we've all been in those situations where we, ourselves and they say I work with theater for young audiences and we watch the eyes close over. Okay? Now the only way the margins are going to get shifted is if we shift them. The only way is through the artistic excellence of our work and our commitment to this. Now much has been said about how TYA might actually build audiences of the future. But we at CTFA are much more interested in the audience of the present. Of the kids that we actually have in our audiences. So I'm just going to encourage all of us who, are as we go through this day, let's not look at TYA as a hope for the sustainability of theater as a profession. Let us look to this as a force that can serve as a beacon for our adult theater counterparts. And it will serve as a beacon for a light that is fueled by courage in the face of complacency, risk in a climate of economic difficulty and peril, and an insistence on artistic excellence that only comes when we invest our best artists, our best, our most serious, our most complicated subjects. Now, not later, now. Now, remember this. We at CTFA are partners with you in this. We are here for you. I'm gonna ask the members of the board that are here just to raise your hand, so if you wanna know a little bit more about CTFA, please come talk to us. And we are here for you. We can give a spark but it's up to you to light the watch fires. So thank you for having us, and thank you for allowing us to participate in this. Teresa Irving? Come on up. Good morning, everyone. Hi, I'm Teresa Eyring, Executive Director of TCG, Theater Communications Group, and a huge lover of theater for young audiences. Um, how many of you are here after being at the TCG conference for? All right, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for that. Um, so we just finished yesterday our 30, our 39th, our 29th uh, national conference here in Miami. And we were so excited to have such an education through line. Um, we started, we had uh, two pre-conferences. One was for education directors. We had about 40 education directors who came together. They talked about empowerment of youth 
voices. They talked about trauma-informed care, and they talked about safety of youth in our theaters. Um, so that was uh, a very exciting session, and we hope to do more, possibly next year when our conference is in Phoenix. Um, additionally, we had a theater and higher education pre-conference. Um, so now that we're gathering uh, as a theater for young audiences convening, um, that makes it kind of a trifecta, so we're excited. Um, really want to thank Greg and the National Endowment for the Arts for supporting this. Um, this is a, a really great start to hopefully what will be a continuing discussion. And uh, additionally, thank you to Young Arts and HowlAround, HowlAround for live streaming. Um, Susan mentioned a couple of things that I wanted to just uh, lift up again and repeat. One is just, I do think in this big, beautiful arts ecology that, that we all are part of, that theater for young audiences has been, and young people in general ha are one of the most marginalized groups. Um, when you think about the funding and the fact that many funders just automatically exclude programming for young audiences, when you think about criticism, criticism is on the decline for all arts, but it's been on the decline for young people and theater for young people for quite a while, and that's wrong. Um, Arts education in schools on the decline or n non-existent. Um, so I think we do have to activate and continue to activate. And I know that you all already have been activated around expanding the margins, as was just said. Um, but I think this is so urgent, and especially now, because I think the generation, this next generation coming up in particular, is really eager to engage, to engage with live art forms, to have their voices heard, to express their creativity, um, so really looking forward to today and to be able to, be able to continue this discussion. Um, I also wanted to mention a few things that TCG is doing. Um, we have a program that's called Audience Revolution, which is really about, and it's funded by the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, and it's really about um, trying to encourage the development of new ways of engaging audiences and uh, developing it's, we call it community building and, and audience engagement. Um, the most recent round, we focused in on programs that are meant to engage young and multi-generational audiences. So there are several cohorts of theaters that are working together on this. And when you look at the list of projects, it will blow your mind. I mean, it's just absolutely, um, it, they're innovative, they are engaging communities in ways that uh, that I just haven't seen much of before. So very excited about those programs. Also, American Theater Magazine, we've been, we have a special column um, that's dedicated for theater for young and multi-generational audiences. And Allison Considine, who's here, where are you, Allison? Is gonna be covering uh, this gather gathering today. So thank you for that, Allison. Um, I think that's what I have for you this morning. So thank you very much, and I'm going to introduce Jonathan Chapman. Hi, everybody. Welcome. It's amazing to look out and see such a range from our field in the room, and I'm so excited about today's conversation. Uh, my name is Jonathan Schmidt Chapman. I'm the executive director of Theater for Young Audiences USA which is a national service organization like our friends at TCG, but focuses specifically on supporting, developing, and advocating on behalf of the field of theater for young audiences. Um, and I first just wanna thank Greg at the NEA for creating this space for us, for being such an incredible partner over the last year and really listening and taking the time to think about how we focus on this field and amplify our voice and our impact. Um, and also our friends at TCG, um, specifically Teresa and Kevin and Lori for being uh, amazing partners as well. This, just the fact that this is happening is a landmark uh, moment. Uh, the fact that these three organizations are partnering together to have this conversation about young audiences in the field of TYA um, is, is a turning point. And I'm excited to think as a group today about how we use this moment as a turning point, how we think back to today, hopefully in a few years, and say that was the moment when things started to really shift. So I want us to get into that headspace now um, and as a way of welcoming, you're gonna hear a lot of information from the stage today, hopefully to provoke conversation at those tables back there. What this event is about is getting all of you to talk to each other. 
because we actually have in the room a real nice uh, cross-section and representation of TYA field leadership from across the country, regional theater, mainstream theater, adult theater, whatever you want to call it, uh, representation from theaters across the country, funders, journalists, and service organizations. And this space, those people speaking to each other, doesn't happen as frequently as we'd like. Uh, so let's really utilize that opportunity and use what we're presenting at the stage to provoke conversations in your groups uh, later. We'll talk a bit more about that structure uh, in a little bit. To get us started, though, because you're going to be hearing a lot of information in the next chunk of time, I'm going to ask you to turn to the person next to you and try to find someone near you who you don't know and maybe share just one thing that you're looking forward to discussing today. What are you bringing in? If, if you've been at TCG all week and things that you're thinking about or if you're coming in fresh and providing the energy that's needed for the people who've been here since Tuesday, uh, what are you bringing into the space that you're excited to explore today? Just share with someone next to you. She was resting on that. So yeah, it just happened all of a sudden. Okay, um, how do I get back to mirroring? Because it's, it's back on my main screen. doing some weird color thing, but... <laughs> all right, thank you. I'm gonna, that's all right. I'm gonna ask you to take just one more moment to wrap up your conversation. Thank you. That's great energy in the room. I'm going to ask you to do that one more time, and we're going to share with somebody else. But this time, I want you to take a moment to think about for yourself an impactful moment of the, of the earliest memory you have of seeing live performance. So for you, what was that moment, the earliest you can remember, that really st sticks with you, that brings back vivid sensory memory? Try to paint that picture as clear as you can. And I'm going to ask you to turn to somebody and share that memory. The earliest time you can remember of engaging with live performance as an audience member.
take just one more moment to wrap up your conversations. All right, I'm going to bring you all back now. I'm, you know, I'm just going to let you talk all day. This is great. Thanks for coming. <laughs> it's already happening. Um, great. Uh, that's the headspace that we want to go into today thinking about. We're going to be looking a lot today at the impact of theater for young audiences on young people today and who they're going to be in the future. So it's important for us to think about that impact on ourselves. Um, and I would argue probably that most of you are in this room because of those memories that you were just sharing. Um, in some ways, uh, that led you to where we are right now. Um, so my goal in, the, in my short presentation here before I introduce our next speakers is to just provide some framing for the day to walk you through where we're headed um, and to give you that arc and to offer some kind of baseline information about the Theater for Young Audiences field, given that we as a TYA community are used to being uh, insular in these professional conversations. Um, we use a lot of shorthand and acronyms and um, assume our colleagues know uh, the things that we are struggling with or the things that we talk about. So uh, while some of the information I offer might be uh, baseline <laughs> and the building blocks to the TYA folks in the room, it's important that we get that into the space so that we're all starting from the same place. All right, my slides are back now, so. Okay, so <laughs> our goals of the day. Uh, we have three goals that we're focusing on today. Uh, one being to examine the current state of the TYA field across the country. Where are we now? To explore the relationship between the TYA field and mainstream theater. I'm using mainstream theater because there's no great term just to talk about theater. Uh, we, uh, obviously, the Theater for Young Audiences world is, um, clar you know, it's specified by audience in the title of the kind of work we make. Uh, the rest of you just call it, you do theater. Uh, but just for our purposes today and the distinctions, we'll talk about it as TYA and mainstream theater. What is our relationship um, as, a, as an ecosystem and how are we working as a continuum and a spectrum across all audiences that we serve. And finally, to envision ways to strengthen the impact of the TYA field in the future. How do we work together and make these connections of the uh, stakeholders who are in this room to think about the ways we push the field forward? When I talk about impact, I just want to clarify. So Susan mentioned this a bit earlier. We, as a, a TYA community, often talk about that top uh, bucket, the intrinsic impact of live performance now. We advocate strongly about the fact that we serve children today and young people today, and that impact is important enough to talk about without thinking about what it's going to do um, to future theater going or where they'll be as adults, that, that children today need the work that we're offering. Um, but we're also going to engage today with the other buckets that we don't, rare, uh, don't often talk about as much, the connection between theater for young audiences impact in terms of lifelong connection to the arts and how we work together with our colleagues in the mainstream theater in terms of that um, lifelong connection and kids growing up and becoming patrons at the theaters that you work at. And also the other, the other strand, the socio social emotional development, um, how we impact all sectors because we work with young people who become the next generation of leaders and citizens um, who will shape the future. And we take that as a field, that responsibility very seriously. So how are we gonna get there? Um, if you open your agenda, I'm just going to walk you through the frame of the day. So our goal with the structure for today is to provide you with, um, with a bunch of information in chunks that then you go take to table groups and discuss. So the morning before lunch, we're focusing on the present, and after lunch, we're focusing on the future. So this morning, you'll hear a few presentations of data uh, from our colleagues in the field around um, providing some tangible research to support a lot of the things that we just intrinsically know or believe. And then you'll hear a panel around the current business model of the TYA field. When we polled uh, our community about what they wanted to discuss today, uh, often we focus solely on the art and not around the structures uh, that uh, provide a space for that art to happen. So we're gonna dig deep into the business model of TYA, what is the same, what is different uh, from our mainstream colleagues and how does that impact all of the other how does that ripple out in terms of the, the challenges we face and the, and the divide in our community? 
That information will guide you to your first table discussions. And the way that we've structured this, we have curated tables, hopefully with a mix of uh, people at each table from different backgrounds and different organizations. You, will, uh, you received a label when you came in with your table groups, and you have two different table groups today. So you'll be engaging with a group of eight, uh, two different groups over the course of the day. You'll have a morning group, and so when we go to that space, you'll find your table in the back, and you'll have a table facilitator who will guide these conversations, taking what we talk about from the stage here in the morning and propelling us into conversation. And then in the afternoon, you'll have the same. After lunch, we'll hear presentations from six different leaders in TYA offering visions for the future, uh, provocations. Um, I, we could have asked many people in this room to offer that, and that, that's what our table discussions are for. So as those six present, think about what you would add. Where, what are you excited about? What are you thinking about for the future of the field? And we'll use those six uh, presentations to guide our conversations in the afternoon, where we'll hopefully go from dreaming to action steps and thinking about how we move forward tangibly uh, from what we talk about today. Make sense? With me? Great. Okay. Okay, so the current state of the TYA field. I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to offer just some general information to get us started, and then I'm going to turn it over to um, Matt Omasta, who will provide some more detail to what I'm, what I'm sharing. So just it, thought it was important to share just the ecosystem of our industry. What are we talking about when we talk about the TYA field? Because we all have very different definitions of what that means. So obviously, the, one of the big buckets is the TYA professional producing theaters. And that's what TYA USA uh, primarily serves. Although we have presenter, presenting organizations in our community, universities, it's wider. But um, we, our main focus are the TYA producing theaters. So venues across the country that are full time producing theaters focused on young audiences specifically in their work. Many of the largest um, theaters in the country are represented in the room. Their artistic leadership and executive leadership is here today. TYA presenting theaters, so those theaters who don't pr produce their own work but present work that tours in um, from abroad or from within the US um, and cre curate a season. Um, that's another component of our industry represented here today. Small to mid-sized itinerant TYA companies. This is a really growing demographic in our in our field, uh, we have a, a large number of new small ensembles that are not anchored to a specific theater space, uh, but create work that, that moves around in partnership with larger organizations or self-produced in spaces, um, and focus on changing models around a physical space being the thing that anchors them to their community. TYA programming at mainstream institutions. So organizations that serve multi-generational audiences but prioritize having a component of TYA programming as part of what they do. So our friends from the Kennedy Center and the Alliance Theater are here today. That those are examples of organizations that include young audiences as part of the, the overall ecosystem of the, what the organization presents to audiences. And finally, Broadway and commercial theater, uh, which we don't often include in when we talk about the TYA field, but it's important to recognize that the uh, number of kids and teens under 18 attending a Broadway show is dramatically growing. Um, this is information from the Broadway League 2017-18 report um, that uh, 2.1 million from that year, representing the highest total ever of young people attending a Broadway show. And you see that reflected in the content that's being produced. If you look now at what is on Broadway, as opposed to what was on Broadway 20 years ago, there's a huge shift in the amount of family shows that are represented. Um, those shows don't classify themselves as TYA, um, and we'll get into that and what that means by um, putting ourselves in that classification versus putting out a show that just serves multi-generational audiences and the differences there. But for the purposes of this, I just wanted to throw out that these are all of the different stakeholders who are serving young, young audiences around the country. And even though we don't always act as a community, we are all part of uh, a, a field serving young people in, in some way. So th the conversation today, the conversation that happens at the TCG conference often that we've all had in various ways that Susan references, are we different? Why are we siloed? Why do we exist as a separate community? Uh, obviously, I'm not gonna get into the long stigma that is associated with theater for young audiences. Even the fact that we call it theater for young audiences and not children's theater is uh, uh, an indicator of our continued struggle to be seen as legitimate by our colleagues, by artists, by funders, by journalists, 
to see the work that we are making as professional theater alongside our colleagues just focused on young people. Um, we could argue that some of the most innovative and exciting new work being created around the country is being created for kids, for an audience that has no preconceived notion of what theater is, and we are getting to reinvent it for a new audience. Um, and yet, we often feel as a community uh, as seen as separate um, in terms of opportunities, in terms of um, the perception of quality. Uh, I think now that stigma is starting to fade away, but it's still sort of in the DNA of our origin story, and it's hard to sort of to shake that off. Um, but hopefully convenings like this will begin to break down those barriers, and we can have conversations about how we operate as a full community. And we are different. And there are ways that make us distinct from our mainstream theater colleagues. And I think that is always the struggle with the TYA field, that we're tr we straddle both sides of that conversation. We don't want to be seen as different. We want to be at the table with our colleagues just as part of the theater ecosystem. And also, there are things that are very different about our business model, about the way we program, that we can't ignore, that, are, that change the, the way we uh, exist in the theater space. So I'm just gonna offer a few of those. You all will have a lot more to add to this list, and I hope we discuss those and break them down at our tables later. So obviously our audience, the specificity of our audience makes us different. Um, we are often programming shows that break down to age groups, brackets of maybe two years. Um, you know, this show is for six to eight year olds. We're engaging with child development to think about how we're reaching specific age groups of kids, which is very different than our mainstream colleagues who put out a show and don't necessarily think, some do, but some don't necessarily think about the specific ages of the people they're serving. Um, first exposure to live performance. So all of our venues are often exposing young people to their first ever live event, which is a huge live performance event, huge responsibility. And those memories you all shared are because of people like who are in this room thinking about how to engage young people for the first time, what that means to introduce them to the theater. School versus family audiences. You'll see as we share uh, data in a little bit that our audiences are made up of public audiences, so families that come to our theaters, and school audiences, so children who are brought with their schools to see our shows, and that is a huge part of the audiences we serve um, and, and affects the kind of programming we, decisions we make, affects the um, ways we can curate a season, and has a lot of impact on our, our model. And then ticket buyers versus primary audience. It may seem obvious, but the primary audience we, we are serving is not deciding to come to our theater, usually. Someone else is making that decision for them. Uh, I've been hearing stories more recently of you know, theaters now putting out content online, creating videos um, about their shows and young people telling their parents, or their parents showing them, do you wanna see this show? And the young person engaging in that way, at least with the family audiences but largely we're serving young people who arrive at our space not having made that decision, uh, which is very different because we're engaging not only with our primary audience, but thinking about the stakeholders who bring them there, the teachers, the parents, the family members who make the decision to come to the theater, sometimes who are not arts goers themselves, who find the arts because they, they've become parents or find themselves in our theater because they're a teacher that is at a school that supports the arts, but they don't necessarily go to the theater on the weekend as an adult. So that's really interesting because we're reaching uh, an, an audience that we're trying to bring to the theater that may not already be a theater goer for a different population that is our primary audience. It's complicated. Some funding challenges. So there are many that many of people in this room will, will happily share, but a, a couple of the interesting ones, so audience retention. Um, our audience cycles out every 10 years. If, if a TYA theater is serving young people, let's say 12 and under, we're always in a state of, of bringing new audiences in and losing audience members as they age out of our programs. Whereas if you are a regional mainstream theater, you may hold on to an audience member for much, much, much longer uh, once they're hooked on, on your programming. It deeply affects our model and the way that we're able to engage and the way that we're able to build revenue or subscriptions or a baseline of support. Parents as donors, so a lot of our theaters, uh, theaters across the country rely on individual donors. It is much harder in the TYA industry to rely on that individual support from the people who are directly engaging in your work. So ideally, with fund fundraising models, you're bringing people in who are already are excited about the work you're doing and want, want to give back 
to be able to support the organization that they love already. Even if a parent is excited about your organization, and even if they have means, often if they have a young child, they're not philanthropic yet at the level that we really need to support our industry or the way that our mainstream colleagues are able to rely on that support. So it makes our job in fundraising much, much harder because the people we're directly serving who are our strongest advocates are not in a place to be as philanthropic as maybe our mainstream colleagues and their donor base. And finally, this art versus education labeling. So when we apply for grants, we are often playing both sides of this coin and failing on both sides. So uh, funders saying, well, n actually, your project is too focused or reading our work as education and not as art. So we're so kind of excluding us from grants that are focused on art making. And on the other side, education grants looking at us and saying, well, actually, what you're doing is not education. You're making art. And we are at this intersection where we want to talk about the high quality art that we're creating at the same level as our mainstream colleagues, but with the same level of professionalism, and also it's having education benefits that we can explain in a different way than our mainstream colleagues around the adults they serve, and yet the, we struggle with that relationship with the funding community and figuring out where and how to articulate our work so that it's understood in both of those buckets. And finally, some of these funding challenges lead to leadership development pathway issues. So TCG does an incredible job of training and thinking about how to engage a new generation of leadership in the theater community. It's something that I hope we can emulate with TYA USA because it's severely lacking in the TYA industry. The leadership pipelines don't exist. Our theaters can't, typically can't afford to have an associate artistic director or an associate managing director. Most of our theaters don't. If they can afford to have a leader, that leader is the person and maybe we can offer internships, maybe we can think about fellowship programs, but we don't, as a field, have real um, training models to bring in a new generation of leadership. Our university programs, while folk, there are many focused on TYA, they're often focused on practice and art making and not focused on organizational management. And because the organizational management programs are broad, and the, and we'll get into it in a bit, um, because of all the funding issues we've talked about, the salaries are typically larger in our mainstream theaters. We lose talented people to that industry, and so it's harder to cultivate uh, people who are passionate about TYA and also have those skill sets and also want to devote their uh, time to our space. And our funding models are such that we can't create the leadership development pathways that are necessary to introduce and widen who's at the table in our industry. Obviously, we, alongside our TCG colleagues, are actively confronting the challenge of who is in our leadership across the country and who's not represented, and breaking down some structural issues that prevent us from reflecting the diversity that is in our audiences. Um, and all of this is related. The fact that we don't necessarily have structures in place to train up another generation of leadership coming into the field as shifts happen. So I raise that just because I, I'm seeing those dynamics happening right now. Um, as positions open up, as the field begins to think about how we grow, um, and not necessarily having the programs to support the next generation of leadership, which is a huge issue for us. Okay, so I'm gonna share some current trends um, that are, we're seeing across the field, just as a way to think about where our theaters are going in terms of programming. So this is not a new one. Uh, but connection to children's literature is a huge component of our industry. Um, some can call that a strength, some can call it a challenge. Um, largely, the vast majority of programming on our stages is based in some way on stories developed through children's literature. Um, you could argue that it's because of uh, our audience demand, whether it's schools or public, but that dominates the conversation in terms of the programming on our stages. Um, and we're often in conversation about how we increase new stories that are being told in addition to working with our colleagues and finding inspiration from children's literature. Theater for the Very Young is on the rise in the United States. This is a trend that's been going on for at least 20 years uh, abroad, uh, but now in the last decade really growing in the United States. So theater created specifically for zero to five-year-olds and breaking that down even further, zero to two or three to five. These performances tend to be much smaller, more intimate, more interaction between performer and audience member. Uh, and our theaters are thinking about how to challenge their models of physical spaces that have 500 plus seats, um, to think about how to serve the youngest in our community, which doesn't necessarily work in that environment. Uh, more and more theaters are thinking about programming all the way from 
infants to high school. So I'm noticing some unique partnerships and commissioning, uh, ways that our theaters are working together creatively within our industry and outside of our industry to expand the canon of TYA and, th and rethink about models for developing new work. I'll just offer a few examples here. So um, there was a, a commission spearheaded by Michael Bobbitt um, of Judy Moody and Stink and the Mad 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 Treasure Hunt uh, that was developed by seven theaters across the country who partnered together to commission one play that had a rolling premiere across the country. So the model itself is really interesting to think about how theaters, that many theaters can come together to support a new work. The World Inside Me, which is a co-production between Spellbound Theater and Chicago Children's Theater, a work for the very young, uh, merging many of the stakeholders in the buckets of the ecosystem I shared. So a producing theater, a presenting theater, an itinerant small to mid-sized company, um, all working together, together to think about how to develop new work that challenges their models. So for an audience of how many a time, 50? Yeah, max. Um, so the, the work was developed through New Victory Lab Works, which is a new, new work development program that you hear, you'll hear a bit about later. And then uh, produced by a small company working in partnership with, with a larger uh, TYA producing theater and then touring to Miami Theater Center uh, as part of a tour. Um, so just thinking about ways to challenge the models around how we work together and collaborate to create new work. Children's Theater of Charlotte and Actors Theater of Charlotte joined together to commission interlocking plays by Stephen Dietz. So the idea that you're uh, creating a play that, that, or a story, a world that exists in one house with the kid characters and the adult characters experiencing something and those two plays happening in sister organizations in the same city, serving adults and young people. Many of you who were at TCG might have heard the session that was presented about it, um, but just a fascinating model of how mainstream theater and TYA theaters can work together. And then finally, the Kennedy Center with their new education artist in residence program, the first being Mo Willems, the celebrated children's author, um, who is working multidisciplinarily <laughs> across the Kennedy Center over the course of two years to develop all kinds of projects in different mediums. Um, so it's just a really in interesting model to take someone outside of our community who's been working with the Kennedy Center on adapting work and thinking more expansively about how to just create experiences for young people across a venue uh, in residence. Artists crossover between mainstream theater and TYA. So we're seeing more and more artists who uh, are engaging more fluidly in artistic practice, not seeing the theater community as a silo that I can only create for young people or I can only create for adults, but starting to work uh, more fluidly. This is just a picture of Anne Washburn and Dave Malloy's Little Bunny Foo Foo that was at Actors Theater of Louisville. Um, and it's exciting to see artists that you don't typically associate with TYA starting to think about what it would be to create for a young audience. Theater created specifically for neurodiverse audiences, so more and more companies focused on creating experiences that take audiences with special needs and think about how to serve those needs as baked into the dramaturgy of a piece and what that means. Um, it's exciting to see that work serving populations that previously didn't feel welcome in our spaces or in the work we create. And finally, exploring current political issues on stage. So companies that are thinking now about how to address issues like gun violence, like the relationship between uh, police and young people, about uh, gender issues, about just uh, uh, being part of a, the national dialogue in a way that's really um, bringing young people into conversations that we as adults are having, but that we need to have their voice in and thinking about how we use TYA as a vehicle for that. We're just seeing more and more projects in the last two years that are really um, trying to engage with right now and what, what's happening, what we're all talking about, and bringing that to the TYA stage. So that was a lot of information. Um, I'm gonna ask you before we move to the next presentation, just take a moment, turn to someone near you, and share one thing that either surprised you or a question that was raised for you from everything I shared. Um, and I hope you see what I shared as a starting point. There's a lot of expertise in this room that I hope we um, add to um, this information that we've shared today. So take a moment to do that and then we'll move on.
All right, I'm going to call you back together now. <laughs> Thank you. And we're going to get to continue these conversations as we move through the day. You're now about to get even more information thrown at you. Okay, so I shared some overview uh, statistics and information about the field, but we realized when I came into my role as executive director of TYUSA two years ago that we as a TYA field don't have data about our industry to support the claims that we believe uh, about our business model, about who we're serving, about where we are succeeding and where we need to focus in terms of growth. Um, and our friends at TCG collect data every year on their theaters. And it's a huge resource for the industry within and externally. And that's something that we wanted to try to bring to the TYA field. So we commissioned research in partnership with Utah State University and Matt Omasta to create the first survey of theaters nationally around TYA. Uh, not the first ever, but um, the most comprehensive that's happened in a long time. And this research that he'll be sharing is specifically focused on that uh, those first two buckets that we shared in the ecosystem. So thinking about venues that serve young people specifically, or organizations that have such a robust TYA program that they would have enough data uh, to contribute, um, focusing on the TYA USA membership. Um, so he's gonna provide some of that information for you now. We're really excited to be able to have some of this baseline information uh, to figure out how we communicate some of the things about our industry that we know to be true, but now we have some uh, responses directly from the field to support it. So. Thank you, Jonathan. All right. Um, <coughs> thank you all for being here. And before I start, I want to say thank you to TYA USA, TCG, the NEA, and USU, all who contributed to this project. So thank you all for your support. Um, some of you have seen some of this information before, if you were at the TYA USA conference a few weeks ago. but. Some of it is new and there's a greater emphasis on finance in, this, in the uh, work today. And uh, when possible, I draw comparisons between TCG theaters through the information available in the theater facts and the information that we were able to gather from our theaters. Um, two things. One, I'm going to show some pretty complicated slides at time. You don't need to write them all down. Uh, we will be publishing a piece in TYA today. And then after that, there will be an even more comprehensive technical report that I'll share with TYA USA uh, so that the data is out there. So uh, it will take a little bit of time, but we will get all of the information out to everyone. Uh, I'm going to be sharing with you like 10 to 15 percent of the data that we have uh, today. The next thing is that uh, there are descriptive and inferential statistics, and I'm not going to get into that beyond saying these are descriptive, meaning the information I show you is true about the theaters who took the survey. So if I say 74% of the TYA theaters serve ice cream at their opening nights, that does not mean 74% uh, of TYA theaters all over the world do that. Uh, this is not based on a random sample uh, and some other statistical things that we do need, would need for that. But it is a diverse uh, group of theaters, and I think it, a lot of what we see here will be useful. So I really like that. I really do. <laughs> I only use it once, but I... <laughs> so uh, where did the questions come from for this survey? Uh, the earliest f survey I can find was conducted back in 1968, um, and some of the questions were posed then are, were posed on another survey that Courtney Blackwell conducted in 2007. Uh, both of these came from various uh, constituents. Most of them came from them reaching out to their personal networks, as opposed to using a more systematic uh, method that we did uh, this time around. Uh, almost all of the data I'm going to share comes directly from the survey, um, but sometimes uh, folks weren't able to answer some of the questions, so uh, Jonathan and I and his staff dug through IRS records to 
to, to get your information uh, when, when it was not provided. Um, so uh, we also looked at other publicly available sites. Uh, in addition to the questions posed on earlier surveys, the TYA USA Board of Directors shared a wide variety of topics that they were interested in, and Jonathan and I worked to get that down to a uh, more reasonable number. Um, so who took this survey? Um, the theaters that participated uh, were TYA, USA affiliated theaters, meaning either the theater was a member, an organizational member of TYA, USA, or with some of the smaller companies, the leadership of that company were individual members of TYA, USA. Uh, and we also defined the scope of this to be theaters that prevent public work uh, a, a full season of work for the public, as opposed to youth theaters that are f primarily more focused on education and, and development of uh, artistic skills with young people. So that included a total of 61 theaters, and 97% of them actually participated in the survey to some degree. The average organizational survey response rate is 40% in the country, so that's really quite impressive, and thank you to everybody who took the time to take that survey. Uh, down in the bottom there, you'll see a little thing that says N equals 59, 100%. Not everybody answered every question. And so in order to be as transparent as possible, that right there will show you how many people or how many theaters responded to each particular question. Some of the times it's all of them, other times it's lower, and that way, and, and that's sort of a gauge on how accurate is this information uh, when we All right, so uh, just some background, thank, thank you, uh, demographics on the theaters. They came from, <laughs> they came from chairs, they came from everywhere. Uh, <coughs> uh, the theaters we surveyed came from 90, uh, sorry, 28 states plus the District of Columbia. As you can see that there's sort of a gap in the less populated northwestern area. Um, but I think it's really interesting and, and no, I would say there's a lot of growth potential in Connecticut, Pennsylvania, uh, some of those states. It's really interesting to me that we didn't have theaters in those areas. Uh, we asked what best describes the theater you primarily work for in terms of presenting versus producing. Uh, the majority produced work and never presented, but another third both produced and presented. Um, uh, Two percent were only Sorry, primarily presented, but sometimes produced, and 5% only produced. So that's the information there. In terms of what should the best describes the theater's audiences, we gave four options, and everybody said that our theater's audience is primarily dedicating to serving young audiences and their families. We asked which described the actors that performed in their 2017-18 season. And 42% the major, uh, was the largest group was all adult actors. A little under a third was mostly adult actors with some child or adolescent actors. 19% uh, roughly an even mix. And only 8% um, primarily child or adolescent actors with a few adults. Uh, in terms of s turning towards finance, we asked if they were a 501c3 theater. Almost our were, but not all. Um, we asked what year the theater was founded, and this is a really cool chart, I think, because it, you have to, once you start to think about it, so 14% were prior to 1950, which suggests that uh, there weren't a whole ton. Um, this is tricky, because obviously some theaters that were open then have now closed, but if we look at 1950 to 1999, 52 percent of the theaters that took our survey were founded in that 50-year gap, about one a year. In the 2000 to the present, which we're only 19 years into, 34 percent of the theaters were founded in that time, which means it's more than double the rate of what was being founded in 1950 to 1999. Again, with the caveat, if you opened in 1950 and closed in 1960, you didn't take my survey, so <laughs> I don't have your information. <laughs> um, we asked if you were institutional members of any of these organizations, 
uh, were organizational members of TYA USA, 42% AATE, 15% IPA, 42% TCG, and 0% uh, the League of Re Re excuse me, the League of Resident Theaters. And for those who have seen this presentation and noticed that it was exactly the same up until then, now we start to go in a new direction. So uh, we asked about total operating budgets for these theaters and either got that information from the survey or from the IRS. And um, <coughs> this is what things look like. So 56% of the theaters in our survey, we were able to get that information on, so 95%. And we're comparing them to the 129 trend theaters in the 2017 theater facts. So that is theaters that participated in the fiscal survey that TCG administered that year. So we're looking at two different years. They are looking at 2016-17. Uh, I am looking at 2017-18. But because we're talking about percentages and not dollar amounts, uh, I think it's fairly safe to, to assume that this is a roughly accurate portrayal. And when the next leader effects comes out, we will then compare the, the two years to each other. Um, once that's uh, something that we're able to do. So, um, a little over a third of the TYA theaters had budgets under half a million dollars and 3% of TCG theaters were in that case. And as you can see, TCG is a pretty direct line up to the majority of their theaters having budgets of $3 million a year or greater. Um, the majority of the TYA theaters are under $3 million. Um, so that gives you an idea of kind of the variety of theaters that are out there. Um, and that's also going to be important to think about later, that in general, TYA theaters had smaller budgets than the TCG Next, I'm gonna go through artistic education and business matters. So we asked a number of questions of artistic directors are those that are in similar roles. And this is the first complicated chart. Uh, we asked them, how important are these factors to you? Very important, important, somewhat important, not important. And you can see the trend going across. The first thing to note is that almost, in fact, the, all of these things, the over 50% said they were either very or somewhat important. Uh, and then as we go down the line, some said they were less important. The, for transparency, I ranked these by the means of the people who responded. Uh, statistics, you cannot make them say whatever you want, but you can change them. Had I, for example, said I'm going to rank these by the percent of people who ranked it uh, very or somewhat agree, the top few would flip around and including stories that tell them, plays that tell the stories of marginalized people would actually become the first uh, item on the agenda. So again, you will get to see a graph like this in writing, so no need to write it down. We also asked our artistic directors who, if anyone, they consulted when they were selecting their season, theater season. Um, a little over three quarters said other artistic staff, um, two thirds school teachers and administrators and potential collaborators such as directors uh, and colleagues at other theater institutions, the theater education staff, and then slowly declining until we get down to the bottom with the board of directors at 26%. Uh, so, uh, what, what, what's not shown in this, but is true, is that everyone consults someone. Uh, so all of the theaters picked some of these boxes, even though none of these are at 100%. Uh, we were interested in self-censorship and asked if there were any plays that uh, artistic directors wanted to produce but did not produce because they thought it might have a negative response from schools, parents, and community members. and. Um, it, it's not a majority, but it's a, a strong major minority at 44% saying yes, we, we chose not to do a play because we feared that it would not be received well by the community. What play, in continuing that vein, going on to, well, what was produced? Uh, 
Collectively, the theater served all ages zero through 18 plus. And the productions fell out this way. 22% uh, of the productions that were done by theaters were TVY, Theater for the Very Young, ages zero to four. The majority, not surprisingly, uh, for children, ages five to 10. Tweens, 11 to 13, 14%, more than I thought it would be. Uh, teens, 13 to 17, 6%, and 1% of the companies did produce some shows primarily for adults. Um, again, uh, sorry, there were 400, and of the 59 theaters, they produced 475 shows collectively in their main stage seasons. So when you go back to look at that, 475 shows, that's how they were distributed. We also looked at if they were adaptations, musicals, and world premieres. Uh, adaptations, again, not a majority, but a very strong minority. Uh, about a third of the productions were musicals, and 21% uh, were world premieres. Um, tempering that is the fact that some of the companies only produce world premieres. Uh, so, so that's something to keep in mind. It's not that 20% of all the theaters did 20% world premieres. It's some did many world premieres and some did zero or one guest season. It was counted in both of those categories. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, capacity utilization, uh, the average percent of the house that was uh, sold. Um, for public performances, uh, the theaters in our study um, sold 73% of their house for public performances, and that compares to 62% of the trend theaters in TCG, uh, uh, TCG's theater facts. Um, we don't know about school performances, though many regional theaters do do them. I don't have any data on them, so I can only tell you that uh, for school shows, the TYA theaters tended to sell about 84% of their house. Young audience members served. Um, those of you familiar with theater facts know that they use extrapolation to do project this is the total number of Americans served uh, by the, the theater movement here in the US. Uh, we do not have the data we need to fully do that, but I can tell you that based solely on the raw numbers of the people who participated, it is many millions of young people uh, who were served by these companies. How were they served? Um, primarily in school performances. That's also going to be very important later on. So we'll come back to that. Uh, new work development was an area that many people were interested in, and we asked if the theaters commissioned or produced new work. And uh, just under 70% said, yes, my theater sometimes produces new work. Add to that the 24% that say they only produce new work, and 93% of the TYA theaters are engaged in new work creation with 7% saying, no, we only license existing material. Uh, we asked for those companies that did new work, how many workshops they tended to hold uh, for the shows they developed in that season. Uh, the mean or average was three. The median, and for those of us that don't like math, uh, again, the reminder is the median is you stack all the numbers up and you pick the number in the middle. That was two, and the mode or most common answer was two. We also then asked how many of the new works they developed went on to be eventually mounted as full productions. The mean was 2.6, uh, meeting of two, and mode the most common answer was one. Switching gears now to talk about education for a little bit, as Jonathan uh, suggested. I didn't mean to show you that slide yet. <laughs> um, there is a complex relationship between TYA companies and schools. Uh, we asked about the types of education classes and programs they offered. 100% of the people who took the survey offered creative drama courses, skill build based courses, improv courses, and play production courses. Um, so all of those are at 100%. Uh, 
dipping down, oh, but still over two thirds did school residencies uh, that did not have to do with productions. We split that out so they went and did education programs in schools that did not have to do with the shows that were on their main stage. 62% offered internships or apprenticeships, 58% did teacher professional development, 50% workshops and classes for families, and then we dropped very far down to 10% other education programs and only 6% offering any type of courses related to the performances on their main stage. Uh, that's a huge, huge slide. Students served in the education programs. Uh, the majority were served in programs directly related to productions, which is tricky because I just told you that only 3% of them did that. So we do have some conflicting data in the way that people respond to things. Um, but uh, about 40% indicated that they served people in programs directly related to their productions, about a little over a third at their schools not related to productions, and 23% at the theater not related to productions. I also asked education directors what they did, and I had a really fun slide last time. This one's a little more boring. Um, <coughs> but this is what education directors do, and you see the two red lines there. Everything above the first line, at least two-thirds of the education directors responding did it. And so I'm only going to read through those, which are ed overseeing education staff, overseeing curriculum development, overseeing budgets, developing marketing, uh, education materials, developing marketing materials, personally teaching uh, courses, um, and then uh, uh, the one, at least one-third scheduled classes were primary contacts for schools directed to TYA. And then less than a third, but some, uh, carried out the responsibilities listed uh, down further down the list. We were interested in teaching artists and asked, did you hire any teaching artists during the 2017-18 season? They did. Um, <laughs> uh, the teaching artists that were employed, we asked a little bit more to kind of get a, a sense of the stability of that uh, field. Um, 10% of the teaching artists were 12 month employees, they're regular employees of the theater. 48% uh, independent contractors brought in for a period of time, 41% seasonal employees, and 1% were volunteers. And of the 33 theaters that answered that question, they employed 1,295 teaching artists. Jonathan mentioned before the uh, questions of uh, pipeline and getting people into leadership programs. So we asked theaters, what do you do in order to develop the next generation of TYA leaders? And there's a few things. 85% of the theaters indicated that they had internship and, art and or art apprenticeship programs. 73% indicated that they hired assistant directors, assistant designers, assistant stage managers, equity membership candidates. Uh, and 63% indicated that they offered training programs or courses. The line after that means those first three were things that you could pick on the survey. Then there was an other option, and these are the things that were filled in, in other. Had they been on the survey, more people might have realized, oh, I do that, and so these might have been a bit higher but because they were right in answers, uh, they included things like supporting professional development for their staff, paying for them to attend TV events, partnerships with universities, uh, the leaders of the company mentoring people at conferences and other where, elsewhere, and having some programs for K-12 students. And the last category that we're going to look at today is finances, and I'm going to look at expenses first. Uh, we have a very detailed breakdown of salary expenses from some of our theaters, but I'm actually only going to look at two categories because I was able to get the information on the, the, the majority of theaters and compare it to TCG. And you'll see that 56 and 54% of, of theater budgets went to salaries. Um, so TCG uh, theaters responded with 56%, TYA USA very similar around 54%. And then all the other will be broken out in the technical report that will be available. Um, next, we asked about uh, 
average ticket prices. And as you can see, for a sing adult single ticket, uh, the price is about double for the TCG theaters uh, than for the TYA theaters. Um, buying tickets is part of a subscription. Um, interestingly, it's actually for this particular TCG theaters that responded, it was more expensive to buy your ticket as part of a season than to buy a single ticket. Um, and the price went down a bit for the TYA theaters. And then I only have data from the TYA theaters on child tickets, $16, uh, subscription tickets for children, $12.37, and the very reasonable price of $7.31 on average for attending a school performance. Th the next slide is going to be the only time I offer in a no, no, I've offered opinions, but I have an opinion about <laughs> this next slide. So we're going to compare two hypothetical theaters. Uh, one based the, the average TYA theater and one the average TCG theater, recognizing there is no such thing as an average. So this is just to get a general idea. So uh, we're gonna be looking at these two columns. So for the shows, I'm assuming that half of the that they sell out every single show at their 100 seat theater with 50% single ticket holders and 50% subscribers and 50% adults and 50% children. So this is for one performance, the money that the, theater, the TYA theater would bring in. The TCG theater, again, we don't have information on child tickets, um, but they would bring in a bit more. Uh, so the gross per performance would be $1,541 for TYA theaters and $3,893 uh, for the TCG Trend theaters, which looks like a little bit, but let's keep going. Um, the TYA theaters total gross would be 39% of the TCG theater. So let's assume that these shows run for six weeks, eight shows a week. The TYA show would gross $74,000, and the TCG Mainstream Theater uh, $187,000, which is $112,000 more than the TYA Theater. Let's then say that these show theaters put those into seasons, that they both offer a six-show season. The season gross for the TYA Theater is $443,000, Dollars and the season gross for the TCG theater is above a million dollars, so a bit of a discrepancy there. <laughs> but we forgot about those school tickets, and as you remember, about 80% of the tickets sold went to school performances at that that price of seven hundred and uh, sorry, seven dollars and uh, thirteen cents, seven thirty seven dollars and thirty one cents. If a theater only produced school shows, a season of six shows, six weeks, eight shows a week, it would gross $210,000, which is under 19% of what uh, income would come from a TCG theater doing the exact same quality work. Um, and that's really, uh, interesting to me because we, we see so much wonderful TYA and it's being done in a, at a fraction of the price that the regional theaters and others are doing it. And you might think, but TYA, people like kids, they prob there's probably more contributed income going to these, <laughs> these TYA theaters, right? Because people like the arts and they like children. No. Um, <laughs> They are, they like it 1% more. Uh, <coughs> so the income for TCG theaters, 43% contributed, 44% uh, for TYA theaters. But this doesn't mean they brought in the same dollar value because those are percents of the what we just talked about. So uh, TYA does amazing work uh, with few resources, and that's the thought that I'm going to leave you with. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Matt.
Um, and now we have one more presentation for you before we take a break so that you can process all this information. Um, I'm really excited to welcome Lindsay buller Malayakel from the New Victory Theater, the Director of Education of, of Public Engagement. Um, the New Victory is just finishing a five-year study they conducted with Wolf Brown on the intrinsic impact of live performance on young audiences. I'm so delighted that we get to present some of this research here um, as part of the wave of the first time this information is reaching the field. It's not published yet, but they have some really remarkable data uh, talking about the impact of performance today on young people and the future. So really uh, providing detail around what we talked about earlier. So, Lindsay. So I am Lindsay, and I'm the Director of Education and Public Engagement. We made up that title. Um, basically, it means that I am focused on everything that is to do with our family audiences, our youth development programs, and most importantly for today, our research. Um, that's me, right over there. Um, and when Jonathan asked what an uh, impactful theater moment was when I was a kid, at around that age, <laughs> my dad took me to see Les Mis at the Fifth Avenue Theater in Seattle, and I cried for an hour and a half. And he kept trying to get me to leave the theater because he thought that I was really upset or like something had gone vastly wrong, and I wouldn't leave the theater, but I was just bawling. And um, the lights came up and the bows to him, and he said, Lindsay, you know, are you okay? And I said, it's just so beautiful. I love it so much. Um, so I just want you to think of that little girl. <laughs> Um, sitting and doing that, and we'll come back to that sort of emotional response a little bit later as well. Um, okay, so today I've got about 25 minutes, and I'm going to give you a little bit of context so you understand how this data was collected and in what context it was. Uh, and then I'm going to talk to you a lot about the research that we did over the last five years. Uh, and then, for the first time ever, I'm actually pairing that with some other research we did, which we have, as we've um, uh, investigated it, realized has all these really um, interesting synchronicities. So context, research, then some different research. <laughs> Here we go. Um, so the context first, the new victory. For those of you who are not aware, we are a presenting house, not a producing house. So in the percentages, you'll see us over all the way on the presenting side. Um, and the main fun part about working at the New Victory is that we serve uh, multiple age groups, everything from the zero to 18 that Jonathan was talking about earlier, uh, multiple art forms, so everything from theater to opera to circus to puppetry, uh, and uh, multiple cultures. So it's really important to us that we're also bringing shows from all around the world to New York City um, for the kids to see. And for us, our school programs are about 40,000 kids per year. Um, our family audiences are about 60,000, so that we're big. Um, there's a lot of kids who come to the New Victory. Uh, and then the other thing to know about the New Victory is that we don't just do performances. We also have uh, youth development programs. We have new work programs. Uh, we have a whole bunch of engagement um, and education work that goes around those performances. Um, so. Okay. We have been, at the New Vic, keen observers, just like everyone that I can make eye contact with here that works in this field, um, of what the impact is of theater and live performing arts on kids and families. You have as well. Um, and so we already knew a couple of things about why theater for young audiences is impactful. We knew that um, it was a unique experience. We knew that it was creating, it was, it, people were telling us about the memories that were being created for their family, um, and that it was these, these experiences that kids and um, parents or kids and adults could do together and have this really amazing time. So we knew all of this just from sort of like living in this world, seeing all those people come through. But we also knew that 
it's the, those experiences are made all the more impactful because they're, you, if you surround them with a whole bunch of education and engagement work. Um, and I got some data about that coming later. Um, but one of the things that has been true for us is that over the course of the time that the new victory has been around, we've gone more and more and more toward this idea that the art is amazing and that if we can create experiences around it for the school audiences and around it for the public audiences, that we actually, are, they're having a more impactful experience. So at this point, about 70% of any given school audience has had a workshop. Um, before and after and or after the show. And it, as of this year, we've just reached that uh, most shows for our families, 60% of our family audiences are actually engaging in our lobbies or in family workshops um, in addition to going and being an audience member. So this is a huge push that we've done over the last few years. If you want to talk more about how and why we did that, let me know after. <laughs> okay. So. This research came about because um, basically we talked a lot about why we were all in the arts a couple years ago. And I would invite you in this moment to take a second and think about why do you work in the arts? What do you think the impact of the arts has been on your life? And I would like you, if, as you're thinking about that, to raise your hand if your answer was it raised your social study test scores. Um, I'm, I'm making light of it a little bit, but a couple of years ago we were reading a lot of, I'm, I love research. I'm not a researcher, I don't have a PhD, I'm not the amazing Matt Omasta, but I love it. I love trying to like learn about what's going on. Um, and I was, I was reading all this research around live performing arts and kids that existed. And a lot of it was working really hard to say that if you go and see a piece of live performance as a kid, it might impact your test scores, your attendance rates. Um, for adults, it was talking about like citizenship for a little while. And these were all, I don't know, they were frameworks that, that didn't resonate for me. Because I don't know anybody who works in the arts, and I don't know anybody who would say the arts are important for society be as a number one reason that they would say that's because we really think it will impact people's test scores and that the best way to make sure that their test scores are higher is to take them to a show. It just, we started to realize that the story that the research was starting to tell about why you should bring your kids to the theater didn't match with why we thought the arts were important. And when we sat down with a group of our teaching artists, our numbers represented in that almost 1,300, and we created this huge list of big post-it paper, because I don't know how to think without using big post-it paper. Um, and we said, okay, so why? why? Why are you part of the arts? What do you think it does for you? What do you think it does for the kids that you work with? And they were talking about these really wonderful things, things like um, it allows kids to learn about themselves, but also learn about the world that is outside of themselves. Um, it, allows th it allows them to um, uh, identify more with their own feelings or be able to recognize someone else's feelings. It allows them to grow their imagination. They were saying these things that I care a lot about, but wasn't really present in any of the research that we were doing to talk about why the arts were important for kids. Um, so that coincided with a large uh, granting organization coming to us and saying like, hey, if you could do one thing for the next five years that you've never had the chance to do, what would it be? And so we basically pitched, let's start a new program um, and simultaneously, let's see if we can develop tools and learn more about what the actual impact on kids is. Um, and so we did. So we worked with Wolf Brown. Are you guys familiar with Wolf Brown? Yeah, some of you. Um, and actually, they were a great partner because a couple of years before this whole thing started, this, this kind of <laughs> crazy idea that has basically eaten the last five years of my life, um, 
they had started to work around the intrinsic impacts with adult audiences. And Alan Brown had gone on that speaking tour and we had gone to it and we were like, oh, that's really cool. The language that he's using is really cool. It doesn't completely match up with what we think the youth development guidelines are around young people, but like it was the first time that we had ever heard someone try to describe it in a way that was like, oh yeah, that gets close. So we worked with Alan Brown, Denny Palmer Wolf, Stephen Holoquist, and Megan Friel to basically take those intrinsic impact um, structures for, that they had done for adult theaters and use them as a jumping off point, basically an inspiration point um, for the work that we did. So, let's see here. Um, here is what we found. I am also going to share about 10% of the data that we collected because we were insane. It was great. Um, the next sort of set of slides is going to be uh, um, the data that's come out of this sort of um, one year of tool development and then three to four years of, of um, data collection. Um, and it was all done in this brand new program that we called Spark, Schools with Performing Arts Reach Kids. And while I talk about it, I want you to imagine that Courtney J. Body is up here with me because my she's the director of education at the New Vic focused on schools. And so the whole program that this was that we used to collect all this data was under her um, sort of leadership. Um, so pretend she's next to me. Uh, she's in New York, but there we go. The program that we started, it was a it was a great gift. We were able to start a brand new program. Um, to be able to use for data collection. And in that program, we specifically chose schools that had sort of no arts teachers, no arts partners. Uh, they were in sections of New York City that don't have high arts participation. Uh, a, a pretty good guess is that most of these kids had never sat in a traditional theater in a traditional live performing arts experience. Um, so we, we, were, we had a pretty good guess that um, uh, the effects that we would be able to chart were going to be attached to coming to shows at the New Victory as opposed to something that they were doing with their families. Um, the other thing is that they were seeing three shows per year and getting 15 workshops with teaching artists and then we were following them longitudinally as they grew older. So we started in third grade and then in we were still with them in fourth grade, and then we were still with them in fifth grade. So that by the time that they exited this program, they would have seen nine live performing arts experiences, and they would have had 45 workshops with teaching artists. Um, we also embedded ourselves in the schools to help support the administrative staff. Um, here is the basically the streams of data that were coming in. I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, but it's just good to know that we had some data that was quantitative, and that we have control groups for. And this is the thing I think that has been sort of, um, uh, we've been getting better at this as a field, but was in some of the past things, we've been really good at being like, we talked to these kids who are part of this program and t they told us all these amazing things that happened for them, but we didn't have anyone to compare them against to say, well, that would have happened anyway. Or if you went to, you know, uh, just because you're getting older, that would be a set of skill sets that would grow. So one of the things that was really great about this program is that we had in some of these data streams the treatment group, so those are the kids taking part in our program, and the choice we made for control group was the exact same school, the exact same uh, teachers, principals, environment, everything exactly the same except they were a year older. So that if you want to poke a hole in my data, that's the hole. And I'll tell you why I made that decision if you want at some point another point, but we really wanted um, the control group to be in the same school building because it, we are just so aware of, regardless of whether this, you know, the free and reduced lunch rate is the same between schools, those schools, those schools feel different. So we wanted it to be nested inside the school. Um, we also had longitudinal data that followed specific kids over the course of time, uh, which was also pretty dope. Uh, I will try to pepper in a few of these tools so that you can see. Some of them were tools that already existed in the research canon, and other people have already said that they are effective research tools. And some of them are ones that we actually used our teaching artists to create brand new research tools to try to dig at things that we were interested in, um, which is pretty fun as well. Okay, this is Val Ong and I. On the last, it's almost a year ago, actually. It was the end of May last year. This is the last moment of collecting data after uh, the five-year process. One of the tools we had kids do is actually to read emotions on other people's faces. We were curious about this. 
can you please call out some emotions you see on either Val or my face? What do you, what do you think we're feeling? Relief? Joy? <laughs> Ecstasy? Yep, pride? Does anyone see terror? Yeah, uh, maybe, especially if you look over in my eyes a little bit over there. Um, <laughs> I think one of the things that has been um, one of the most exhilarating aspects of my life over the last five years is that this, this is a huge commitment that we have taken. It's taken, a, I was in the Bronx and in East New York at like 7.30 a.m. multiple times uh, in the fall and the spring over the course of five years. Um, and we were a little bit worried that we wouldn't find what we thought was true, that we wouldn't have created the right tools, or that we wouldn't have asked the questions the right way, or that maybe it just didn't exist. Um, so, let's start to figure it out. Here's one of those tools. Uh, if you ever saw the intrinsic impact studies for the adults, this is an adaptation. So think of Val Ong and I, you saw us, um, with tiny pencils and survey booklets, and like the, the, the kids are in the, the theater, and the curtain comes down, and they've all taken vows, and then Val Ong and I run down the aisles with hundreds of tiny pencils, and for 150 kids and the entirety of orchestra, orchestra right, we're passing out pencils and surveys and they're filling out all their emotional and like um, connective responses. And then 10 minutes later, we collect them all again and we send them on a bus. So this happened uh, for uh, how many? That happened for 5,000 kids <laughs> over the course of five years. Um, so we did it a lot. Um, and here is an example of the kind of information we saw. So these are two different shows that we both did post-show surveys for. Um, Generation NYZ at the top is actually a uh, Ping Chong and Company um, show that worked with New York City young people that had grown up in New York, talking about how they um, existed throughout their childhood. Um, and then the show on the bottom is Pedal Punk, which is this like steampunk circus. Really fun. Here is how the kids talked about the impact of those two different shows. So let me, let me sort of share how to look at this map. Think of it as a footprint an impact footprint. Um, there are four different sort of intrinsic impacts that we were really interested in. The first was personal relevance. So questions like this were like, how much did this show make you think of your own life, of the people that you know? Um, how much did it reflect on who you are? Social bridging is those questions about how much did you learn about someone whose life was different than your own? How curious are you about someone whose life that is um, in a different part of the world, different experiences? Aesthetic growth, that's the version, you know when we all sit in theaters and we're like, wow, I've never seen anything like that. Or just like our heart opens and our brain explodes and you're having that experience in the seat. <laughs> Aesthetic growth is our terminology to try to capture that experience. And then motivation to action, if you're really familiar with the adult um, impacts, you'll notice this one is, is, a, is not on the adult impacts. In our testing, in that first year of tool testing, we kept getting kids telling us, I want to go do that. They saw a show and they were like, I want to roll on the floor like that circus artist. I want to make a penguin puppet and manipulate it. And we realized that one of the things that we needed to start tracking was how much this made the kids like want to engage their own imagination. So the orange one is the Generation NYZ, the Ping Chong show, and you can see that the impact that the kids were identifying that this show had on them was way high on the personal relevance. This was making them think about their own lives. It was also pretty high over there on the social bridging. This was making them think about people's lives who were different than their own. Versus Pedal Punk, this amazing circus show, is trending out toward motivation to action. So it made them want to do things. Um, we have 15 shows worth of data around this. And we all, as arts professionals in this room, know that of course every single show has a different impact on kids. And you would never expect pedal punk to have the same impact as Generation NYZ. But I don't know about all of you, sometimes it's hard for me to explain to teachers, to parents, to funders, to our board, why Generation NYZ is such an important show for kids to go see or why someone might want to go see pedal punk as opposed to um, a more narrative show um, if you're a teacher. So this kind of language has really been helpful in helping us communicate out to other stakeholders why you might want to go see this show for your kids and what impact it might have on them. There's another of these maps. Um, 
just pulled this one this week. I'm so excited about it. I'm sure you are too. Um, so this map, I know it's the same colors, but this map is actually just looking at pedal punk now. So that blue is the exact same. So that blue one is pedal punk. Um, and it's the exact same shape because that's still pedal punk. But this time, the orange, <laughs> so the, the, the orange, the only difference between the blue one and the orange kids is whether they uh, had a workshop with a teaching artist before going to see the show. So these kids, same school, came on the same bus, saw the exact same performance on the same day. The only difference is that the kids who answered, who are, are represented in the blue triangle thing, had teaching artists come to their room prior to coming to see the show, and the kids that are the orange did not. They came to the show without that experience. So one of the things that this is telling us is, you know, we had been seeing for a long time that these pre-show workshops and this family engagement around a show was impactful. We now have data to show us exactly how it is impactful and what that looks like. And we have it in a lot of different ways, which is also fun. Um, and this is pretty much true. The only time that this one gets a little wiggly, if I, as I go through the different shows, it gets a little wiggly down in aesthetic um, growth because something happens to kids once they've seen about five shows where, and I like to call it, they become savvy theater goers. Um, where they start to, um, it starts to be harder, or the, that aesthetic growth one becomes more variable, right? So that, you know, if it's a show that they really loved and never seen before, that's, it's down and pointy. But if like, oh, they're like, oh, another circus, just like the one I saw last year, oh, well, maybe that aesthetic growth comes up a little bit. So that one plonks around a little bit. Okay. Um, let's keep going. You would expect that if we bring kids to the theater and work with teaching artists, that they will like theater more. Luckily, <laughs> that showed up to be completely true. <laughs> I know. I got worried. Right before we got all this data, I was like, what if it's not true? Um, <laughs> it is true. Um, and it's actually really true, which is another fun thing to note, um, which is, so this uh, D, and again, I'm a program person, I do not have a PhD in this, but as far as I understand it, the D um, is basically, number is a marker of how big the impact size is. Um, and the Department of Education, I believe, uses a .25 sort of like line in the sand, that if you have a D number that's above that, it, it, then they say, yes, your program was impactful. Um, it's called like practical significance. So in year one, we were at twice. DOE's threshold, and in year two, we're almost at three times. Um, so that's cool. We would expect to see that, but I actually want to draw your attention to a piece of information that is in, inside this graph that I think is what we all need to be talking about. On the second graph, that black line that goes precipitously downward are kids who are in the control group who never saw theater. And that is the difference between about age eight and about age 10. It's great, I mean it, it's great that the kids who are coming to see theater like theater more. <laughs> good job us, we're doing a good job. Um, but I was not prepared for how stark that number would be for kids who were not seeing theater. It is not as if we can now pretend that if kids don't see theater until they're 15, that it's just as good as them seeing it at age eight. Because it's not. And if we really care about when we invite kids into the theatrical space, if we want these kids to think that theater is for them, that they are theater goers, that theater has a place in their life, if we're not starting until age 15, we are starting in the basement. And I know that in some ways, this is the perfect crowd to say that to because you all firmly already know that, but the data is way more stark than I thought it would be. And in a minute, we're actually come, gonna come to a second piece of data that talks about that from a different point of view. Um, here's another version of um, uh, another question that we loved, which is I can imagine what the life is like for other people. And again, our, our kids are part of the treatment. That red line is going up. 
again, our control kids declining slightly. Um, and then um, one of the impacts that actually was the biggest surprise, so we had this, we took this tool and um, we wanted the set of questions at the beginning of this research tool that was talking about future theater going. It was like a whole bunch of questions that were asking kids, you know, do you think you'll go to, would you like to go to the theater with your family? Would you like, do you think you'll go to theater as a grown up? Um, and we really wanted those questions. Um, and then the, 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 that research tool went on to ask some really big old heavy questions. Things like, uh, do you think you'll graduate from high school? Uh, do you think you'll get a job? Do you think you'll be happy? <laughs> They're like, they were, and we didn't want to use them. We were like, dear Stephen Holoquitz, our, our like statistician, can we please stop that tool right there, just at the audience questions and not use the rest of it? And he was like, no, if you want to be able to compare your data to the data that's already been collected, you have to use the whole tool. And we were like, this is a real bummer, but like, okay. So we collected this data that we kind of didn't mean to. Um, and the, the research terminology is future orientation data. Um, and it told us something really interesting, which is, it turns out that according to the research that we've done for the last three to four years, that going to see live performing arts and working with teaching artists actually impacts the amount of hope that young people have for their future. And as a reminder about who the kids were that were filling out these surveys, these were kids who were at schools with at least 90% free and reduced lunch, though most of them were up to 95 or 97%. They're kids who are experiencing housing instability, food insecurity. These are not kids that are living the life that you might wish for them. They're kids that are really struggling with some aspects of their life that we would like to have them change in the future. And it turns out that along all of these sets of questions, kids who are getting to go see live performing arts and work with artists are actually more optimistic about what their future will be like than kids who are not. I didn't expect this. It's not what we built our programs for. It's not what we built the workshops for. It's not what we curate shows for. We have some data that's qualitative that was able to follow individual kids over time in much more deep ways. And we think what's going on is that as you raise kids' ability to think about lives that are other than their own, and simultaneously raise their ability to practice their own imaginative skill sets, you raise their ability to be able to say, what if? What if this choice was different? What if my life looked different? And that that changes their own hopefulness for their future. Now, this is one piece of data that in second and third year, it kind of flattens a little bit. And that partly for me is because I'm, I'm aware I didn't help build a program toward that outcome. And it's a big question for the new Vic Education Department about what if we start to take this particular outcome as something that we intend to do. Um, and what, how would that change our um, work? Okay, the last little bit of this. I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna switch gears. You know how um, Susan said today we're not gonna talk about um, kids as a predictor of future, future audience. I'm gonna talk just a little bit about it. <laughs> but only because I actually think it's really, um, it's an interesting comparison. Um, I clearly have spent five years of my life caring about why the arts for kids as kids. But then my colleague Lauren, who's right over there, did all this research about like as uh, adult audiences, what were your theater going habits as a kid? And it turns out there's like all this information that actually dovetails really amazingly with what I was learning when I was in terms of impact. So let's jump into it. Caveats about this. So Lauren worked with ERM, which is a market research different than Wolf Brown, which is like research research. Um, and this data all comes from New York City respondents, so if you have this kind of data from other cities, we would love to hear about it because I think it would be really interesting to do this more nationally. Um, a couple of sort of uh, fun, uh, fun statistics. So about 70% of all theater goers who go as adults win as a kid, right? 51% um, who do not go to theater now did not go as a kid. Uh, another way to think about that particular statistic is all of my control kids, those, that black line that went down, 
Like, those kids did not go as kids. They are also most likely not going as adults. Um, and it's, you're about twice as likely, um, if you attend pretty frequently now as a grown-up, you are about twice as likely to attend pretty frequently as a kid. So if you attended as a habit when you were a kid, you are much more likely to attend as a habit when you are a grown-up. But then two pieces of information that um, I love. So of our regular theater attendees as adults, um, you were twice as likely, if you were a regular theater attendee, to have seen theater by the time you were in pre-K. And um, for adults who attend theater regularly, about 80% of them had seen a show by the time they were 10. So this piece of information is the other side of that graph that I showed you, which is if we do not start bringing kids to theater before the age of 10, we are starting from the basement. And I'm not sure we have ever been quite as clear about that as the data that we now have currently indicates. I've always thought like, yeah, we should totally bring young kids. I have young kids, they love the theater. I didn't quite realize how much of an impact it would make on whether they were ever going to attend the theater and whether they felt like theater as an art form was meant for them at all. Um, so the recap. We know that theater affects kids across a variety of impacts and it changes based on what shows you bring them to. We know that uh, it definitely changes whether they think theater is for them and it changes how they view their own world and the possibilities for their own future. We also know it increases the likelihood that we'll continue going to theater as adults, especially if they start before the age of 10. So, as we go forward today, this is my question. This data that we've collected over these five years has shown me all sorts of interesting things, and we're getting down into the, like, the minutia of it for all sorts of things. But one of the things that has left me with that I did not think before is that starting before the age of 10 is much more important than I had originally anticipated. And I think that as an ecosystem, that brings up some really interesting questions for all of us. Um, the responsibility that Jonathan talked about about bringing young people to the theater, I know I take it seriously, I know so many of people in this room that this is their life work, um, and I think that today it's a really good opportunity, I'm so excited and thankful to be here, to make some grand plans for what that can look like in the future, especially knowing some of the things we know now. My last caveat is, uh, um, we're not published yet, so we're going through a peer review process. Apparently, this takes a long time. <sighs> um, <laughs> so the way, um, if you are interested in getting the reports once they're finally published, the way that we're collecting that now is we're basically collecting all anyone's email address. If you would like to be um, emailed that report once it finally goes out, you can come to this email, uh, this website, put in your email address, and we'll keep you updated. Um, but it might be a good six months or more. That's it. Thank you, Lindsay, and the New Victory Theater for um, creating a study that impacts all of our work and that we can all use, and also for racing to be able to present it here before it's even published. I don't know about you, but my head is really full. We're running a couple minutes behind. We're going to take a 10 minute break now, come back at 11.40 for our next panel. Um, and I encourage you to continue the conversation, meet people you don't know, and we'll see you in a few minutes.
All right, everybody, we're going to get started in about two minutes. Two more minutes, just find your way back to your seats. Hi friends, let's gather back please. Let's gather back, if I can have my panel come up to join us. Shh, 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 shh. Let's gather back. If I can have the guests on the next panel come join us. While they're joining us, my name is Michael Bobbitt, I'm the current artistic director at Adventure Theater for the next month and a half. <laughs> I am racked with grief and additionally emotional from hearing Lindsay's report. Uh, and so grateful because uh, the reason why I do this is because some theater like the New Victory came to my poor black elementary school when I was in first and second grade and gave me a theater experience and I became hooked and it saved my life, literally saved my life. So as I move on to what I call adult children's theater, uh, that's the new name, that's the new name, Jonathan not mainstream, adult children's theater. Uh, just know that I will be a huge advocate, huge advocate for, um, for incorporating TYA into the full spectrum of the theater community in Boston. So uh, I, am, I am with you, I'm with you. Uh, also, uh, you know, um, I, I think this is the most important room in theater in this country today. Uh, tomorrow will be the Tonys, but today <laughs> it is this. Uh, I think it's a monumental and a historic event, um, and we've heard lots of information that I think will inform some of the conversations we're going to have later. Um, I do want to um, point out two different reports that I read recently. Um, there was an article from Broadway League that said that there were eight shows last summer on Broadway that were for children and families, making a third of the income on Broadway. Um, also, TCG and American Theatre Magazine posted a um, result of a survey that said there was a decline, a little bit more than 1% of a decline in ticket sales to adult children's theater, um, and a, 12, a more than 12% increase in theater going to um, children and family shows. So even with that success, we have strained business models. We have underfunding, we have stigmas, we are marginalized. Uh, and so this panel today will will talk about all those things. So I will invite you guys to announce yourself and your organizations. Awesome. 
Hi, my name is Meredith Suttles, and I am the Director of Development at TheaterWorks USA in New York. My name is Megan Babo Schroyer, and I'm the Associate Managing Director at Imagination Stage just outside DC. My name is Kevin Malgasini. I'm the Managing Director at Seattle Children's Theater. And I'm Steve Martin, the Managing Director at Child's Play. Uh, on our panel, we have, uh, I think most of our panelists have had experiences not in children's theater prior to being in children's theater. So we thought they would be able to offer opinions that will support um, the, the structures that we are, uh, the difficulties of the structures that we're facing. Um, I want to um, uh, make sure we have time for questions, so uh, I'm gonna jump right in. Uh, we're gonna ask Steve to lead this first question. Um, the question is, the TYA business model is built off of the same model as the regional th nonprofit theater company. Is that business model the right model for TYA? Why or why not? Um, I, I just want to preface a little bit. I've been in um, uh, nonprofit professional theater for about uh, nearly 40 years. Um, half of that time I worked in large theaters, um, and half of the time I've worked for Child's Play, uh, which is great, spending 20 years with the company. Um, a, a little bit of history really quickly, um, and I learned this, I, you know, I didn't study uh, uh, theater business um, at all, I kind of fell into it. Um, so I learned a lot of this from, from Peter Zeisler and Peter Donnelly and Edith Love and uh, Vicki Nolan and a lot of people that I was lucky enough to uh, work with. And um, the regional theater business was really started by or funded and encouraged by the Ford Foundation um, and, f and an organization called FedAPT. Um, the Foundation for the Extension and Development of Professional Theater. And, um, and there was a model that was set up uh, in, in FedAPT, and it was that there would be an artistic director, a managing director, and a board of directors. And, and that each of the, of, the, of the professional leadership would report independently to the board of directors, creating this kind of tension. Um, and the tension was intended to um, encourage um, out of the box and innovative artistic programming, um, as well as responsible um, financial uh, management and administration um, of the organization. You know, I've been really lucky that I have um, been in uh, arranged marriages um, uh, as a managing director uh, for most of my career, and and I feel like those uh, relationships have been um, successful. Uh, but I've seen dysfunctional relationships as well, um, uh, much to the detriment of organizations. Um, where now, uh, do those kinds of relationships work well with um, uh, uh, theater for young audiences? It's hard for me to know because I believe that um, through my, my experience, is particularly at Child's Play, the relationship has, I think, worked successfully. Um, for us in creating great new work, um, in making sure that we can make payroll, um, and, and that we're I having a significant impact on our field and on our community. So I, I feel like it's been successful. Now let's look at TYA companies. How many of you work for a company that was founded by a junior league? Yeah, so, you know, this was like, you know, this was a phenomenon that during the 20s and 30s that junior leagues, volunteers got together and created theater for young audiences, um, theater for kids. And then those companies evolved over time uh, and, and, in and in fact took up the mantle of, of being um, uh, 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 organized like um, regional theater companies. But they were really volunteer run organizations. Um, and were really embedded in their community. Um, so uh, when we think about the history of how we were organized and what we do and w why we do, it's very uh, uh, different uh, with, with those companies. I think that the Alliance Theater Companies, Chris, you can tell me their children's theater company started in the 20s or something uh, and, and is likely headed toward its 100th, its 100th anniversary. Uh, just kind of stunning. So, um, so that's a little bit of history. You know, does it work? I guess for some of us it does. You know, but I think that for some of us it doesn't. That's why we need executive artistic directors, um, executive managing directors. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm just gonna pass this down and see how other people feel about this. Yeah, you feel free to offer some. some. Well, I'll say um, I was talking to our artistic director, uh, Janet, about this particular question. I'm new to TYA. I've been with Imagination Stage for about six months, but before that, I was at the Shakespeare Theater Company in DC as a fundraiser, which is obviously a huge behemoth mainstream theater. Um, and I, so I'm new, and uh, there's a lot that I don't know about TYA history. Um, and she was telling me a bit about how TYA is so important 
the model that exists um, because we're so ingrained in our communities and that allows us to be really responsive to the needs of our communities in terms of what we program on stage and what we offer in our education programs. And she was telling me a bit about how, you know, in Europe, the, the model is very uh, similar to like a dance company where you uh, rehearse and then you tour and you're not rooted anywhere. Um, and that has a lot of financial advantages, but for your community, it really misses out on, on that being deeply rooted um, to your community. And so, you know, we're sort of grappling with imagination stage, coming up with maybe some sort of hybrid model where we can do both. Um, to, to make sure that we can continue to serve our direct community but reach new audiences too, you know. And so, you know, some of the ideas that we're thinking about to explode the existing model are, you know, maybe there's a space for devised children's theater somewhere off site, you know. Um, maybe that's something we need to look at. Maybe we need to look at more international collaborations so that we already do a lot of international collaborations, but maybe we need to do more of that. And that allows us to tap into funding overseas where they do support the arts quite a bit more than um, we're able to in this country. So um, I agree, I think that the model does work for some of us um, to varying degrees. The way that, you know, honestly, the regional theater model works for regional theaters to varying degrees. A lot of them are not in great financial shape either. Um, and so, you know, so this is an opportunity in our history for us to think about ways that we can adapt and uh, reflect on the existing model. I, I would just add, um, as a uh, representative here from TheaterWorks USA, who is a touring and does not have, um, <laughs> so it's, it's very much opposite. Um, so we, we actually are looking for ways to be more deeply rooted in the communities that we serve. And um, you know, some of the things that we're thinking about, right, is, is um, how can we approach the teaching artist model and, and being in communities that really, um, you know, we pride ourselves on being able to go to communities that really don't have any access to theater at all. So we pop up there and bring the theater, um, you know, whether or not you have a, a, a base, you know, if not moving into a theater space, we can come to you and bring the stage and do it for you. Um, and so thinking of ways that we can um, engage that community around the art is something that, yeah. So given the, um, the strains on the business model that, you know, as we heard in Matt's um, slides, that the cost of uh, producing and administering TYA is the same as adult theater, right? But uh, we bring in less than half, almost a third of the ticket price um, that, that adult theaters bring in. Our patron base ages out when they're 10, right? Um, and funders often give us, as my friend Nina Meehan, the Bay Area Children's Theater says, give us child-sized gifts, <laughs> right? Um, so given that, what are um, some of the unique differences and challenges in organizational management um, that the TYA field can learn from uh, that's different than mainstream regional theater world? And Megan's gonna help us with that. Yeah, um, I mean, it really does, I think, come down to our audiences and the fact that they're aging out. Um, we all know that acquisition of patrons and donors costs a fortune, and it also takes so much, so much of your resources in terms of your staff time, and the success rate is limited. And whereas a regional theater or mainstream theater expects their patrons to walk in the door and stay with them for 40 years, if they stored that person right, we've got 10 years, that's it, and they're gonna age out. And so that process is something that we have to work on all the time. And that's a huge management challenge for our marketing team, for our fundraising team. Um, and it's something that we have to think about all the time with everything we do as we're creating our budgets and what's on stage. Um, so that I think really is, is the primary management challenge difference. I think there are, there are other things that are smaller that come from that too. I know that um, you know we're a small theater, we're five and a half million. Uh, there's another small theater in town that's a mainstream theater. They don't have an HR department. We do have an HR department. We think that that's important. If we're a theater dealing with children, it's important that we have somebody that really knows the rules around that. That's a liability issue, but it's also our responsibility to the children walk through our doors. Um, so that's a big difference, I think, it, that another way that we have to think about that. Also, our budgets are small, and you know we've talked a little bit about professional development and bringing people up through. Most of the people that work in our organization, many of them, are earlier career, you know, and so not only do they not have 
the, the skills that are really important for that acquisition that has to happen all the time, when they learn them, then they leave and they go someplace else. And then we have to train somebody else in three years to do the exact same thing. So, so those, are, those are definitely challenges um, that I think are very unique to us that really all stem from the fact that we're reaching children primarily. I also think we are dealing with a more, um, a more diverse tent when we're talking about this than necessarily the Lort theaters. I mean, saying you're small at 5.5. Um, I, I know there's, when we look at the budget size of TYA theaters, the diversity there is just extreme. So everything from um, who works with which unions to budget sizes to really different work groups than many of our Lort theaters have from teaching artists um, that create a big chunk of the theater. So I think um, trying to talk about all of us as if we are, um, as if everything is the same is really challenging as well. So when you look at applicable skills going from one company to another company, when you look at um, the way in which we are managing work groups being the same from one to another, it's just uh, the variety within our field, within this tent that we've created of TYA theater, um, creates a, a specific challenge to executive leadership, I think. I will add that um, what's interesting to me is, is uh, when we look at our budget and we're talking to planners and consultants, um, it's a surprise to them to see that not more than 15, not more than one revenue source uh, can, uh, makes up 15% uh, of our uh, total revenue um, package. So we have our academy programs, we've got professional development programs for teachers, we've got residency programs, after school programs, um, even our donor uh, uh, pool um, is, is very, very diverse um, that way. Um, it, when we talk about earned revenue and ticket sales, it's ticket sales to families, ticket sales to schools, um, so everything is, and we have to pay attention. So if you're talking about one is one revenue source is no more than 15%, we have a lot of programs that we are having to pay attention to um, to make sure that we're reaching all of those various um, uh, different revenue goals as well. Um, uh, so it's a, it's a very uh, interesting, dynamic, um, and yet exhausting um, uh, 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 pro uh, program to be able to manage. I feel like th it's been said. <laughs> um, it, but I, you know, so SNAPS, I support all of the things that you've already mentioned. Um, I agree that there's really, um, it's very nimble. We, you know, the, what we ha how we operate in the capacity is very nimble. And um, from the artists that we're working with to the administrative staff that we're working with is primarily, um, you know, emerging, uh, primarily, you know, new. And so the capacity to, um, re-teach and you know it's 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 a you know the trend is a short-lived amount of time in the spaces that we're in and so um, yeah it's a, it's a difficult uh, model to survive in one of the things you learn about when you're doing working on subscription models is that it takes um, 50 bucks to acquire a new subscriber and 50 cent stamp to renew a subscriber um, so if you imagine in the TYA world if our subscribers age out when they're 10 the amount of people we're trying to convert to become subscribers is very expensive. It's very expensive. And if um, Lindsay's report is right, if we don't get them by the time they're 10, it makes it harder for adult audiences to have patrons, right? So where should the investment be? Should it be in the younger audiences? I think so, I think so, right? Um, so uh, a question, the next question we have is, wh what are the ways uh, we see TYA field leading the overall industry. I'm just gonna point out, uh, well, beyond the creativity that we see, like the puppetry and the movement that's now being used in all kinds of theater everywhere, um, we also, in many ways, um, have solved the diversity problems because we're doing so much ticket, free and reduced tickets to um, schools that can't afford it. Uh, our audiences, if you come during the week, it is probably mostly people of color. Um, I know that's the case at Adventure Theater. Um, the other thing I would say is on Matt's slide of the 475 plays produced in TYA last year, 100 were new works. 100 playwrights <laughs> got money from us. So that's a huge thing that's happening in the TYA field. The number of commissions that are happening in this market is, is unbelievable. Do you guys have any other examples? Sure, I do. Um, TYAs seem to be mostly led by women 
which is pretty awesome. Uh, I know that at our organization, our founder is a woman, our uh, founding artistic director is a woman, almost everyone on our senior leadership team is a woman, our board is more than 50% female. Um, that's pretty awesome. So, I, and that is certainly not the case at many mainstream theaters. Uh, and so I absolutely think we're leading the way there. We're making it a place where women really want to be engaged, so. that we're just in our own and our community we're 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 leading the way in um, equity diversity and inclusion training um, in arts organizations no one is doing what we're doing I have to kind of credit TCG and Teresa and the focus it's made a huge difference um, uh, for us being here and knowing and understanding the importance of that and that you know I don't know that other service organizations have that really intense focus it's it's made a big difference for us and when we talk to the symphony or the opera people they they have no they have no clue what we're talking about they have no idea you know we spent nine hours in training with our staff anti-oppression anti-racist training you know so that you know so we're 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 adventurous we we take the leap you know we're, it's really cool yeah i think there's an added responsibility because uh, teachers are bringing a whole classroom full of children and the importance of them seeing themselves reflected on the stage. There's an added responsibility for TYA theaters to be more reflective of the community at large because those young people aren't opting in themselves. Somebody is opting in for them versus mainstream adult child theater, whatever you want to call it. Uh, the ticket purchaser is the one that's actually opting into that. So they are actually less diverse audiences often. Um, the responsibility is greater for TYA theaters, and by and large, they're stepping up. It's one of the reasons so much new work is being developed, so that we are telling stories that are representative of the young people in the audience. And I would just add that, it, in addition to right, creating the stories and the audience being so m diverse, that also creating the environment in which those um, individuals who come are comfortable and want to continue to engage with the art form because so often, right, if, if we, um, as mainstream or as adult uh, theater, I also call, call, it call it big kid theater. Big kid theater. theater um, <laughs> if, you know, they're having to go in and do the work of um, making the new audience that they're trying to attract to come to the space feel comfortable and want to return. Um, TYA is do, has been doing that. that you know, like that, that's a, a real, um, we have, we're ahead of the curve in that, in that regard, and that, that's something that um, a big kid theater can um, take away from the ways in which we operate. We, we really do um, find ways to make everyone feel comfortable in the space, and that's, and reflect it on stage, yes. There's a lot of work happening in the accessibility of, of theater um, for differently abled people and differently learning people. So uh, just to point out that the Sensory Friendly and Autism Performances was founded at a TYA theater, and now it's crossing over into the dance world and the music world, um, and so that's another way we have been leading the field. Um, Kevin, uh, what do you think the TYA industry can learn from regional theater and vice versa? And then the second part is how can we partner? Um, I've been thinking about this question a lot today in terms of our strengths and our challenges, and everything that we have talked about as a challenge for TYA theater is also obviously our strength, as in life. Um, the nimbleness you're talking about, the, um, the variety of different theaters that all fall under the TYA umbrella. And I think that's a lot of what the Lort Theater or regional theater system can learn from TYA theaters, is that nimbleness, that willingness to continue exploring, continue um, uh, challenging their preconceptions about what it means to be producing work. I think the other thing that is so key is the specificity of audience, that um, TYA theater, unlike regional theater thinks about audience at every step of the way. We center that young person's experience um, throughout the process. And you will never hear a TYA theater practitioner say, I created the art, I'm not going to explain it. Um, you know, we are, <laughs> and you will hear that from a regional <laughs> theater professional. Um, in TYA theater, yes, we are re awarded for, uh, rewarded for creativity, but we are also rewarded for clarity. Um, and I think those are huge gifts as you think about opening the door and inviting more people into the art form. Um, this is not an exclusionary art form that you have to have an MFA in order to be able to show up in the audience and enjoy. It is intentionally something that we want to um, make clear and accessible for the broadest audience possible. And I think that is something the regional theater movement could definitely learn from 
TYA theater. Um, I, I want to add that um, the it, it's amazing that when you look at the what the playwrights are being produced this year, it's Karen Zacharias and and Jose Cruz Gonzalez. Um, uh, Karen has been writing plays at the Kennedy Center and and uh, for TOA companies for a gazillion years. Um, Jose Cruz Gonzalez has been Child's Play's playwright in residence for more than 20 years. Um, and so we're really happy to see that they're being discovered by big people theaters um, as well. And, and, and I also want to say partnerships are really important because we know we're artists. We know we're creating art. Um, we don't pretend that we're experts in doing anything else. When we do a play about um, of the impact of um, suicide on a family. We know we have to partner with the Mental Health Association of Arizona to make sure that we're telling the real story. We're telling the truth um, about what's going on in families today um, regarding that. You know, so we're, we're, we're really good at, at finding those partnerships and putting the information together and getting it out there and being responsible to our communities. I'll just piggyback on that to say telling the truth and also providing the wraparound resources because education is so centered as part of most of our missions um, and the fact that we work so extensively going into classrooms and, and um, doing workshops and whatnot, the, the partnerships are there but then the follow-up resources and the connections beyond just the play are there and that's something that I think the regional theater um, field could learn a lot from TYA theater as well. Um. We also taught them that if you do a family-friendly play, you sell four tickets instead of two, <laughs> right? Which is a huge revenue generator for those theaters. Um, you know, an interesting story. Uh, a few years ago uh, in D.C., um, and Janet and David and Kim will remember this, but the Washington Post decided unilaterally and arbitrarily to stop reviewing. They said children's theater productions, but they really meant children's theater. Um, or children, uh, TYA theaters, because they still reviewed children's shows at adult theaters, and they still reviewed the touring shows that were coming in, like The Grinch and The Lion King and, and Matilda. Um, and when we met with them, we gave them the numbers, like the number of artists we're hiring, the size of our budget, uh, th and the, the, the size of the audiences, and they were gobsmacked. They had no idea that our numbers were as big as the other regional theater numbers in the city. Um, and so, one of the ways I think we can we can partner is that, uh, and this is again my, my charge to adult theaters, and now that I am in this position I can do this, is to make sure that we're taking care of those people who are on the front line, uh, making audiences and making uh, um, artists. Um, our last question is for Meredith. Um, in what ways do you think the relationship between philanthropy, the philanthrop philanthropic world and the TYA world can be strengthened? Well, you just, I mean, we just have to make tickets accessible to everyone under 10 and fund us for that. No, that's, that's it. <laughs> Drop the mic, that is it. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, I have, again, uh, my primary experience is um, in fundraising is in big kid theater. Uh, so this is my first um, opportunity to fundraise in um, theater for young audiences. and. The difference that I see, right, is, is that um, we are given the children's menu. Of, and I'm like, well, I know that, no, actually, no. I know that there's other things that you can, we can eat from, you know. We want to see the full menu of opportunities. Um, and also, um, I hear a lot of it's prescribed, um, kind of in terms of how in funding our artists who create work for um, our stages, and that uh, because it's you know adaptive, or you know we're licensing work from children's you know stories, that we are prescribing the work to the artist, and so it's not really about artist-centered work. And I'm like, well, how is that the case? So um, I I just I think that um, you know in ways that funders could support um, is to one you know have better conversations with us about um, the full scope of the work that we're doing and that um, we are indeed um, beyond the um, beyond creating um, a pipeline beyond creating a pipeline that the work that we're doing is ex comparable and um, you know just as you know important and fundable as the theater for the big kids 
Yeah, I mean, I absolutely agree. Um, and coming from a fundraising background, I have that some similar perspective. Uh, but thank you so much for your research. Yes. I think that uh, it will really prove anecdotally what we all know and feel. Um, but any conversation that funders, foundations, government agencies, individuals are having about audience building that doesn't include TYA is missing a huge piece. Um, and I agree we need to think about the people who are in our audiences today. But if we want theater in the US to continue the way it's been continuing, obviously we need to be making an investment in uh, making sure that kids have access to really high quality theater before they're 10, preferably by preschool. Um, and so that for me is the biggest way that we can work together. We can be a little bit more honest about, about what we need um, and about our financial situations always, but really the bottom line comes down to uh, supporting TYA, investing in TYA is investing in the future of theater in the United States. TYA theater is marginalized. It has been for a long time. And like any marginalized community, we need strong allies with power to stand next to us and say that TYA theater is important and legitimate. We know dollar for dollar, it is a better investment than investing in big kids theater. Um, we need the NEA and TCG and big funders to stand with us, whether that means committing an entire year to focus really on TYA theater, whether it means a funder highlighting, you know, when you're doing you know, uh, new audience programs, really investing in TYA theaters. Like, it is a community that is constantly fighting this notion that, um, that it is auxiliary. Uh, when really it is so fundamentally centered um, and important. And we need strong, powerful, financially affluent audiences and allies to stand next to us um, and like any marginalized uh, field would. I also, a couple of things. Uh, one is that, you know, when our work is being um, assessed um, and, uh, through a grant application or a work sample, it's so important to have people from our field uh, sitting at that table um, uh, assessing that work um, when you know we ask people who don't have a clue about what theater for young audiences is to make decisions about funding theater for young audiences it's kind of crazy um, because they don't they don't know and so you know we would ask funders to to uh, encourage people in our field to be a part of that decision making process first um, second you know our our donors age out as quickly as our um, our attendees do. Um, you know, when a parent is finished, when their kid is done, they move on to their own kind of charity and, and or um, arts organization to support. And so we depend a lot on institutional and, and governmental support. It's really important. And, you know, when we talk about um, tax policy, why aren't we encouraging and incentivizing corporations through tax policy to make donations and support our communities? And we don't do that. And so, you know, and it, we talk about, you know, cutting taxes for corporations. Well, let's cut taxes for corporations that invest in their communities. You know, I think that that's a way for us to increase that institutional and corporate pool that makes it better for us because that's where we're going to get most of our money these days. Um, they brought up a, a thought um, that in the race equity world, there's a term called radical universalism. So basically, all policies exist on a bell curve, right, to take care of most of the people. But on the ends of that bell curve, people are being screwed, for lack of a better term, right? Um, and so what, and, and, but what often happens is that um, the people that are being screwed the most, marginalized people, continue to be screwed. So, so policies don't work if they exist on a bell curve. So radical universalism flips that and says that policies need to exist like this. And so the people that are getting screwed the most are being taken care of the most. And those that have the ability to get it another way are taken care of least by policies. So what they're talking about is that funders need to look at all the policies they have in, in, in how they make decisions about who gets funded and make sure they're taking care of the people that are being marginalized the most. So in, again, in the race equity world, there's money going to organizations white organizations that are doing diversity work, 
but money's being taken, taken away from organizations that do that work already, that are, that are people of color led or, or serve those communities. So I charge you to look at radical universalism as you're looking at your policies for your funding. Um, and that's sort of what, what Kevin and Steve were sort of talking about. Um, I also, it, because you made me think of this, is that um, also in, right, thinking of funding and, and working with the theaters or those, those communities that, um, like partnering with those communities in, in the spaces in which you are so that um, there's, uh, you're showing the need in various ways in terms of racial, um, cultural, ethnicity, all of those different um, other things that we all are, that we come together in terms of, um, you know, partnered in terms of funding opportunities. So we're sharing, showing the community impact and the work that we're doing within those communities through these, those on the margin. So we're, we, within our field, are on the margin, but then we're also serving those on the margin. So how can we come together to um, create and uplift and cr increase funding, increase better policies for those communities? My last idea is maybe the adult regional theaters can sponsor children's shows at children's theaters. Why not? It's a pipeline, it's a pipeline. I mean, I hear all the time, we have trouble getting those 25 euros into our theater. Well, because we haven't been supported from the ground up. So anyway, uh, I would love to open this up to, we have 10 minutes, I would like to open this up to, yes. I yell at them to stop it. <laughs> it doesn't work. Um, did you guys hear that on this side? Okay. Anyone? You, you need to repeat the question. How are we sort of dealing with uh, sort of adult theaters moving into the children's theater world? Those theaters that are producing Elf and Annie and Sound of Music and Matilda. Um, that is the same audience that we've been serving, that we are serving. Um, First, I want to say the more the merrier. That's not necessarily true. It's easy to say that in um, Seattle, where our regional theaters aren't actually uh, producing for young audiences for the most part. Um, some are, but not all of them, but not most of them. I think the other thing is it's actually pushed us to, to um, skew even younger than we have in the past. So to really, like, specificity of audience becomes even, even more specific. So rather than doing multi-generational work, which is a wonderful thing to do, but at the same time is not actually centering the experience of the young person where every element of it is actually focused on that experience. We're focusing more and more on you know, three to eight years old and really centering the experience of the young person at that stage in their life. Um, I don't know that that's the right answer, um, but that's what we're doing right now. I, I agree, M the more the merrier, please. You know, keep offering, you know, the, the more opportunities to bring families in, the more opportunity we have to get to them as well. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of more. Yeah. Hold on. <laughs> um, I would say what we're doing is partnering with them um, and doing um, co-productions and uh, around, around the work. That's what we've been doing to say, well, mm -hmm. sharing the cost. Here we all are. Yeah, great. So the more the merrier, but also then partnering in the work. OK, I have a question for the panel. As someone who has been in this business longer than a lot of people in this room have been alive uh, and has seen the growth <laughs> of this profession go from colored jumpsuits and cubes playing to schools, I think one of the most exciting things to, is to see the rise of the business model, to see now multi-million dollar theaters, to see th theater for young audiences playing with the same size budgets on the scale of all the big guys. Now, here's my question about the other side of the curve. Do you feel with this growth that we have seen in size, in scale, and in scope, that theater for young audiences has become more conservative and more risk averse because of the commercial bottom line that exists? I mean, I know as a playwright who has written a great deal that is not adaptation, I could say, quite frankly, I don't think I would have the career that I have had had I been starting now. 
So what do you think about really original work for young audiences and work that is riskier commercially? I mean, I'll say that at our organization, it's about finding a balance. Um, we do commissions, but there are only so many we can do. They're more expensive. Um, and in terms of risky work, you know, it, we also have to balance the budget with these limited resources. Um, and so that does have to be taken into consideration to be, uh, to be smart financial managers to ensure the longevity of our theater. So I do think, um, you know, just in creating our budget this past year, we did have to make some difficult decisions about the degree of artistic risk we were able to financially take. A hundred percent. I mean, yeah. the reality of size, like at some point, you're bigger and you, there is more risk. There's more to lose. There's further to fall. Um, it's one of the things I love about the diversity within the TYA field is there are still really small theaters producing really great work. Um, and when there aren't 80 people depending on you to make their mortgage payments, it's much easier to take bigger risks. Um, so I do think one of the things that's going to help the field stay vital um, is the fact that there is more diversity in budget sizes and more opportunities kind of throughout the range. And I think that's a really important element of the field. What's interesting, I think, about our field is that we, our audiences trust us, I think, more um, than than you know, adult uh, companies because you know they're making parents are making an investment in what we bring to them, and so if they come to a work that they don't they don't know the title and they have a great time, they're they're going to trust us the next time um, as well. So you know we'd love sure we'd love to have five of our six plays being you know risk um, uh, uh, based uh, titles, and that you know the holiday show is what pays for the rest of them. Um, I, I would love it, but that's not the reality that we're in, but we still like to hear new voices, and Negri f is an example for us. You know, and in fact, her show is going out on national tour next year, and you know, it's not a well-known uh, playwright, but we're really excited about it, and uh, it, those, those are the things that we have to play more up on. I would say our audience trusts us. I don't know that the decision makers are always as trusting as our audiences. The audience is like, I mean, how great to have an audience that doesn't have preconceived notions about what theater is or about what story is. They will go on any journey with you, you take them on. Um, it has been, I'm a year into my position, and it has been surprising how conservative the decision makers are in a lot of instances. And young people in this country are ready and willing to step up to the plate and have important conversations, to recognize an individual's intersectionality, to uh, dive into the world around them in ways that educators and parents, I think, are still very scared of. And that has been an interesting thing um, to wrestle with. We can be much more adventurous. We do a summer season where young people are on stage. We can be so much more adventurous in those titles because the young people are like, yes, yeah, sign me up, I want to do that thing, um, than our main stage titles uh, where adults are making the decisions. And I think that that's a good point and speaks to the, the concern that some of us have when you know the adult theaters, the mainstream theaters are doing something like Elf because the primary consumers, the person who's getting the emails for Escape from Polygro Island versus Elf are more likely to pick Elf because they know what that is um, when the child would be more than happy to attend both and almost certainly happier to be at Escape from Polygro Island, which is made for for people experiencing what they're experiencing at this point in their lives. And so that's uh, the concern, you know, that yes, the more the merrier, but also um, we need to make the table bigger than rather than taking from us. Uh, and yeah. Um, I will just say that um, the worst and the best part about my job is picking the season. There's so much pressure. There's so many masters to answer. Um, and also, um, kids are just smarter. I mean, they, you know, this, this generation of kids will be the smartest human ever to exist on this planet. Um, and when I was a kid back in the late 1900s, um, <laughs> I, learning, learning was so slow. We had to learn the Dewey Decimal System and all that stuff. And so, but they are learning so fast. And I think that when, when our friends at Disney went to New York in the 90s, 
the, the quality of, of, of theater and children's theater went up, and the expectation of the audiences went up too. So in our small regional theater towns, we have to produce something that looks like what they're used to seeing. And so it's just more expensive. And so picking the season is really, really hard, really hard. Um, I, we, we use, we call it mission moments, that I get one or two mission moments a year, and the others have to balance out that mission moment. So, two minutes, one more question. To go back to this idea about, about risk taking, it costs money. You know, we all agree to that. And, and in this corner, Cassius Clay, we had to raise an additional, I don't know, $40,000. We didn't reach our goal in, in having to raise that additional money. But that show, the response, our, our intrinsic impact survey responses were that we, that show impacted our audiences more than anything. And I guarantee you, that audience will come back more more times than the person who came to see Elf. We didn't do Elf, but you know, if that was the case, they will come back more and they will trust us more because of that. So, so you know, the whole idea that we have to do blockbusters, those people aren't mar they're not they're not making an investment in us. The people that come to see Cassius Clay are making an investment and they're going to come back and they're going to be loyal audience members to us. That's the kind of risks that we need to be taking. Also venture. Oh, thank you. I would also venture to say, um, right in the with the fundraising cap on that, they also will remember that. And while there is the lifespan of a of a donor in the immediate, <laughs> it's cyclical. So you know, when you go back to someone and they're like, oh yeah, I remember I saw Cassius Clay when I was there, and they're bringing and you know, so they're gonna that that sticks with them as well. And so yes, I mean, I think managing expectations around it. It's balance. That's, that's ultimately what it is. Um, so Daniel Pink says that we are at the dawn of the creative age, uh, that we've gotten through the technological age and the information age, and now all the world's problems will be solved via creativity. And I think what's so important about this room is that you're all creatives, and some of the questions we're going to have during our lunch are going to be about how do we really creatively incorporate TYA into the fabric of American theater. And so I think Jonathan's gonna come up and tell us about that, but let's thank our panelists. Thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you, Michael, and all of our panelists. So it may feel we're very full of information right now. Uh, it may feel like that was the meal, but I want you to envision that those were the ingredients. That's your table. The morning was our table of ingredients, and what you're going to do now at your tables is make the meal. Okay. So uh, in just a moment, you're going to find your first table group, which is on your label, your AM table group. That's where you're going to be for the next until two o'clock. So you have an hour and a half there. Uh, we're going to get lunch now grab lunch and then start conversation. Every table has a table facilitator who's got the same guiding questions that we'll all be following for the morning. And um, for this morning part of the conversation, as best you can, try to focus on the present. All the things that we looked at this morning were where we are as a field right now, because where we'll be in the afternoon is focusing on the future. So focus these conversations as much as you can to dig deep on where we are as a, a community right now. Um, a note about lunch. If you were somebody who, who needed a special dietary uh, need for your lunch, if you indicated that, your lunch actually has your name on it. So find your box lunch with your name. If not, you can just choose from the lunches that are there. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes, the question was how do we best uh, scribe and document what's happening at the tables to report back. I'm going to ask that every table elect a scribe. You can rotate who is the scribe. You can take no handwritten notes, which you can give to Olivia from TYUSA. Where is Olivia? There she is. She will type up your notes. Or you can type your notes and email them to info at tyausa.org. And we will be collecting everything. I'm not sure if Greg mentioned it earlier, but the NEA will be publishing a report based on today with all the information presented as well as information that's captured at tables. 
So please document your conversations. Try as we get table facilitators, I'm looking at you, as we get closer to the 130 mark, um, trying to uh, cull the information and distill the conversations down so we have some tangible points that we can report back. And then we'll come back at you for our vision presentations uh, and focusing on the future. Enjoy your lunch, bathrooms are around the corner, um, and start conversations as soon as you're ready.